uh, professor you can uh, start your presentation Uh, professor, you can start your presentation, Professor. I think you need to unmute yourself. Uh, Dr. Arun, am I audible? Yes, Professor. Yes, Professor. We can hear you. Sorry for the inconvenience class. It is due no, no, nothing like that, sir. Nothing yeah, like yeah. that, sir. It's quite understandable. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Professor. You can continue. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Thank Arun, you. for your nice words of introduction. And dear participants, uh, first of all, I congratulate the organizers of this ICS uh, sponsored seminar on the COVID 19 and its impact aftermath. The topic uh, that has been uh, given to me uh, for today's presentation is food security and nutrition systems. So this is the topic that I am going to uh, share my ideas to the participants uh, in today's uh, conference. Uh, the contents uh, that on which uh, we are going to uh, have some discussions on national lockdown, pandemic, food security and nutrition, supply chain disruptions, widening societal inequities, disruptions to social protection programs, food price increase, poverty reduction initiatives in India. So with this, first of all, uh, we must admit the fact that uh, during uh, national lockdown in 2020, we uh, noticed that the spread of COVID-19 and the measures taken by the government of India and individuals to contain the spread of COVID-19, uh, we could uh, see that uh, many people were thrown out of work and uh, the income of the people even uh, who are uh, in employment uh, has got reduced to the highest level possible. So these two impacts were noticed by many people in India and all over the world. Uh, particularly, uh, this condition of uh, throwing out of uh, work and uh, reduction in income has led to uh, many uh, miseries on the economy of India. To quote, uh, this uh, COVID-19 crisis was one of the harshest in the world because as I have already told you, many millions of people were thrown out of work and uh, uh, this uh, COVID-19 pandemic had reduced earnings of many people those who remain employed. So we can uh, imagine that uh, even though those who are employed uh, can be caught into severe uh, lines of poverty, uh, it could be admitted that uh, the conditions of uh, unemployed people and uh, employed people in uh, unorganized sectors uh, could be uh, many more. When income of the people 
uh, is getting reduced what will happen then the purchasing power will be reduced when the purchasing power will be reduced uh, naturally the uh, demand for goods and services will be uh, reduced that will make the economy worse and worse so when the demand is uh, affected uh, we cannot imagine production and when there is no production at all then uh, the price of the commodities and other related services will also be increased uh, which uh, could uh, make the people uh, very uh, saddened to uh, be on the path of economy uh, uh, when we talk about the subdivisions of economics so consumption production distribution exchange and uh, public finance all the subdivisions of economics are uh, are uh, expected to be affected due to this uh, covid-19 pandemic uh, making its impact on the working people and the purchasing power of the people so this kind of uh, purchasing power and economic rise is uh, continued even after the national lockdown uh, in addition there was a severe disruption of public services too including the nutrition related services particularly in midday meals also so many students were unable to uh, get uh, midday meals during the lockdown because uh, the government all over the uh, all over india has uh, locked down or closed down all the schools and educational institutions so the poorest of the poor who always uh, are dependent on the midday meals uh, were getting worst affected so this uh, impact is uh, severely uh, understood by uh, the people who are uh, living uh, in rural areas then the uh, health sector also is getting affected uh, health management information system has brought out the fact that the uh, covid 19 related health services were increasing on the one side and on the other the uh, health services which are unrelated to covid 19 are getting affected take for example the data given by health management information system uh, had uh, clearly brought out the fact that only 80% of the children for antenatal care has been given importance and 74% of child immunization was uh, realized and only 53% of uh, outpatient attendance uh, was uh, noticed in the uh, hospitals and other uh, primary sectors primary health centers in india so this particular fact uh, is that the health services related to covid 19 alone has been on the increase and other health services unrelated to covid 19 have been worsely have been affected in a uh, manner uh, in which we cannot imagine so that is that point we have to take into account the non health services which are highly unrelated to covid 19 are uh, not on the increase so keeping all these uh, in mind we should uh, analyze the dynamics unleashed by the pandemic uh, which are affecting food security and nutrition in fact uh, we can classify the dynamics of uh, uh, the pandemic related factors which affect the security and nutrition uh, maybe disruptions to food supply chains loss of income and livelihoods the widening of inequality disruptions disruptions to social protection programs altered food environments uneven food prices in localized context so if we are able to understand uh, these dynamics uh, unleashed by the pandemic which are uh, heavily aff- affecting the food security in india and the nutrition in particular uh, we uh, can understand to what extent the covid 19 has impacted our indian economy particularly on the income expenditure and health sector and that 
is uh, being linked with the other environments of food and uh, social protection programs and so on and so on so forth so this particular point that is a number of overlapping and reinforcing dynamics have emerged that are affecting food systems and food security and nutrition including disruption of food uh, supply chains loss of income and livelihoods widening of inequality disruptions of social protection programs altered food environments and uneven prices in localized contexts so these dynamics have to be understood uh, very carefully and uh, with uh, utmost care so that uh, we can understand the impact of covid-19 on indian economy this uh, chart is helping us to understand the dynamics of covid-19 that threaten the food security and nutrition when we talk of uh, food security and nutrition we should understand the concept in terms of adequacy and uh, in terms of nutritious food so in that sense covid-19 has led to many impacts uh, starting from lockdown policies deepening inequalities global economic recession disrupted supply chain chains disrupted social protection uneven food price effects changes in production altered food environments and all these uh, factors collectively have led to increased poverty and food insecurity so uh, we can conclude that all the dynamics and its interrelated factors which were happened due to the covid 19 have collectively or have uh, made an amalgamation of the entire poverty in india which uh, is in particular we can say that uh, poverty has increased and food insecurity has also increased so this two important uh, aspects of increased poverty and food insecurity which are against food security can be clubbed together with the dynamics of uh, covid-19 that are found to be threatening food security and nutrition so this is a very very important one if you look at uh, the effects of uh, covid-19 on food systems over time we can classify or categorize into initial effects medium term effects and long term effects as far as initial effects are concerned we can have global and local disruptions of food supply chains due to lockdowns which affect perishable food items leading to food wastages and other uh, impact is massive job losses and income constraints which lower the purchasing power of the people uh, which in turn affect food access so when we talk of food security access to food items is very very important but this access is also affected by the massive job losses and the income decrease which lowers the purchasing power of the people then yet another impact is that school closures mean loss of school meals for millions of children and the other uh, impact is related to fear fresh foods available in uh, markets take for example fruits vegetables and uh, dairy products leading to poor diet quality but one thing we should accept the fact that the people uh, uh, and their behavior in the consumption of uh, fruits and vegetables Uh, has increased during the covid-19 pandemic so that kind of uh, consciousness the people has uh, caught into their mind and uh, but uh, on the whole during the uh, pandemic we could uh, accept the fact that fresh food uh, habits of the people uh, got affected then another initial effect is that early export restrictions by some countries of the world on some food products uh, 
cost, supply, and price disruptions. When we restrict to the export of items across the nations, definitely the supply chain will be affected. If supply chain is affected, then the price will be disturbed. Coming to the medium term, uh, the impact of uh, COVID-19, uh, we can uh, admit the fact that farm labor and the input constraints, uh, which affected production and prices of the commodities, and food system worker illnesses contributed to continuation of supply chain disruptions. Global recession uh, sends millions into extreme poverty, further diminishing their ability to access food. And uneven food price effects in local context impact food import dependent countries. So when some countries are dependent on imports for their um, food availability in that uh, countries, uh, definitely there will be unevenness in terms of price effects. And altered food environments affected access to healthy and nutritious food. So when we lack uh, healthy and nutritious food and when we are able to when we are not able to get adequate food and with the nutritious and healthy access then we can say that uh, we are not in uh, food security standards we are uh, uh, realizing food insecurity in fact uh, as far as long term effects are concerned loss of livelihoods people access to food resulting in a massive increase in hunger, uh, loss of uh, food system livelihoods, uh, threatened food system stability and uh, resilience, shift in uh, diets to less nutritious foods, impacted health and livelihood uh, prospects, ongoing uncertainty, constraints, long-term investment in the food, and agricultural sector and diminished attention to climate and biodiversity threatens food sustainability. So when we are uh, listening the lectures delivered by Professor El Vengrachalam and uh, Professor uh, Pray Raj, we could uh, understand uh, and realize the importance of sustainable development. So in the long term, uh, sustainability is getting affected due to COVID-19 uh, in the midst of uh, uh, variations in price and variations in food supply, variations in uh, the availability of food and variations in uh, the health services and so on and so forth. So the, the, this slide is uh, uh, teaching us the effects categorized into uh, initial, we are short term, medium term, and long term. Uh, coming to uh, supply chain disruptions, there have been major disruptions to food supply chains in the wake of lockdown masses. Even though we have, uh, we have, we means that the government has taken many measures to uh, save uh, this uh, chain, uh, we uh, which have affected the availability of food pricing of food items and the quality of food. So when we talk of food security uh, as a concept, these three components, that is availability of food, price of the food and the quality of food are very, very important. But when what happened to these components, all these uh, three components have been affected by the lockdown measures of the government during the lockdown. So another thing uh, we uh, uh, identified is that uh, the societal inequities have been widened. The global economic slowdown uh, have triggered uh, the uh, spread of the disease itself. And uh, there has been exacerbated societal inequities in most countries of the world. Uh, here it is uh, pertinent to quote the impact of green revolution also 
green revolution as uh, madura swaminathan has rightly uh, brought out that it is not a green revolution it is a grey revolution because uh, there uh, has been uh, widening inequalities among the farmers uh, and among the states of india uh, haryana and punjab have become richer and richer and other our particularly tamil nadu has become very poor and poor so even uh, though we had a uh, um, uh, green revolution uh, uh, thanks to our uh, former minister dr c subramaniam and dr ramos swaminathan and so on so forth, right so this is an important impact of then another dynamics is disruptions to social protection measures uh, when we uh, study the economic systems we have three systems capitalism uh, socialism and mixed economy so uh, in uh, so socialism and mixed economy uh, this uh, social protection program is uh, felt uh, as very very important program uh, even uh, nowadays we are talking about uh, bringing the old pension scheme into the street so actually speaking uh, 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 in order to counteract the capitalist countries in the world uh, lenin uh, had introduced this system in russia which threatened other capital countries too. that's why all other countries including england had introduced pension system so now we have uh, uh, social protection programs which we believe that these programs help us to uh, uh, get rid of the so called societal inequalities inequities between haves and have nots or rich and poor when the lockdowns began most schools were closed which resulted in the loss of school meal programs in both high and low income countries so this is this was a very pathetic uh, situation in india even though uh, if we have money in hand we could not buy more of commodities during uh, pandemic g20 governments offered to freeze the debt service payments for 73 poorest countries so this fact has uh, in fact uh, shown that to what extent the poorest countries have been affected due to lockdown particularly on the arena of the provision of social protection programs so disruptions in this sense uh, is a very great impact negative impact of uh, covid 19 then localized food price increases pandemic has really increased the prices in local markets why because uh, imports and exports were Uh, not uh, permitted therefore global uh, scene uh, has uh, turned into increasing the prices in the local markets global cereal stocks are at near record levels and world food commodity prices overall fell in the initial months of the pandemic so this is a very very important one dynamics of uh, one of the very important dynamics of covid 19 this figure 3 uh, is also bringing out uh, the dynamics on the six, di- six dimensions of food security one is access then availability then stability then utilization agency and the sustainability as far as uh, access is concerned uh, we can attribute to the impact of covid 19 on loss of jobs and income higher food prices disruption of school meal programs curtailment of safety nets and diminished access to them 
closer of proximity and informal markets then uh, comorbidities so these dynamics can be linked with access of food then coming to availability uh, supply chain disruptions labor shortages closer of high risk processing plants closer of restaurants and food stalls sit to lower risk crops uh, all these are uh, linked to availability of food rights uh, food then coming to stability this stability can be attributed to supply chain disruptions uncertainty on markets and inputs access price volatility then export restrictions then shift to cheaper and less healthy diets shift towards processed and self stable food link between malnutrition and covid 19 or uh, very well uh, linked to utilization of uh, utilization services of uh, uh, food system and of course agency and sustainability are more important which also can be linked to many dynamics of covid 19 or the impact of covid 19 in fact you come across many common factors which are linked to all the six, di six dimensions of food uh, uh, to be very particular we can take the loss of jobs and affiliation of uh, uh, food item food losses and income losses and price increase and a disruption in the supply chain system and uh, uh, reduction in the um, social welfare programs and so on and so forth are common factors which are uh, said to be linked to all the six, six dimensions of food security then poverty reduction initiatives in india so uh, starting from uh, 1951 when india uh, had begun uh, with the first five year plan we were uh, talking about uh, Uh, poverty reduction and un unemployment uh, eradication so but uh, nowadays as of now also we have the poverty existing in even uh, the capital capital countries even in america uh, uh, the very uh, recent initiatives are uh, these programs uh, uh, sagy the national rural livelihood mission then uh, deen dayal andhyotya yojana national urban livelihood mission mahatma gandhi national rural employment guarantee act then pradhan mantri jan dhan yojana so all these yojanas uh, were uh, the initiatives on the part of the central government but even in the midst of uh, uh, launching all these poverty reduction programs uh, here uh, as we see in the picture uh, the poverty is uh, uh, more uh, concentrated uh, among the people of india particularly in uh, uh, rural india and uh, the uh, outskirts of urban india then now we can have policy recommendations uh, as far as policy recommendations are concerned uh, we can uh, uh, have yeah 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 yes this global hunger index Uh, nowadays uh, when we uh, turn out the pages of uh, uh, newspapers this global hunger index uh, is uh, talked of among the people and particularly indian government has not accepted the uh, global hunger index uh, calculation uh, done re recently 
uh, not accepting that uh, India is not in the one hundred and seventh place. So their uh, claim is uh, different from what uh, the uh, calculated figures uh, that we are able to uh, read uh, in the newspapers and the new arrangement and. Uh, <clears throat> Then policy recommendations. One of the policy recommendation is enhancing the resilience of food systems to simultaneously address the impacts of conflict and climate change and to ensure food and nutrition security. If uh, all the um, state governments uh, have come forward with the donors uh, and must promoting interventions in uh, food security and ensuring the food availability, then we can uh, um, get rid of uh, the bad impacts that COVID-19 had uh, impacted on poverty and income. And the next uh, policy recommendation one can offer is um, base actions on a thorough understanding of the context and strengthen inclusive locally led initiatives. So whenever we are uh, witnessing the impacts which are unfavorable uh, due to the COVID-19, it is better always to think of uh, local uh, measures which will be very, very uh, useful to uh, protect the people in terms of uh, um, <clears throat> protecting their jobs and uh, income that they earn through various sources. So this is a second recommendation. Then uh, the commitment to uh, flexible need-based cross-sectoral and multi-year planning and financing. This recommendation will be very much useful because if we are not flexible of, or if we are inelastic in our thinking without committing ourselves to be flexible, or if we are not need-based, if we are not following cross-sectoral <coughs> understanding, and if we are ready to have multi-year planning instead of uh, prayer planning and uh, multi-year planning and financing, then, then we, it, it will be very, very uh, amenable on the part of the government and on the part of the individual to <clears throat> get rid of the impacts which are unfavorable to the people. Then another recommendation is on addressing conflict on a political level strengthening international law and ensuring accountability for rights uh, and violations, etc. So when we have many political parties in India, we have to respect the conflict. We have to give uh, our uh, uh, air to the views of other political parties also. So addressing this kind of conflict and strengthening the international law, which will be ensuring accountability for rights, violations, etc., will be the first recommendation one can follow in terms of reducing the impact of COVID-19. <clears throat> 
recommendation which is uh, very very fundamental he is leading the way to fundamentally change the food system so whenever we are uh, getting into some fearness during covid 19 many doctors advise people not to fear not to fear you just change the food that you are taking consuming so during covid 19 pandemic as i have already uh, shared my view that it is not my view it is a general view the habit of uh, people on the consumption of fruits and vegetables had much increased during the covid 19 pandemic so changing food systems and even in agriculture also will be very very useful to address the issue of uh, uh, food systems and food security in uh, thank you arun thank you sadasivam sir knowledge madam much. thank you there is a question i can see posted uh, by gopinath sir okay explain policy recommendation number 2 uh, yes sir yeah green policy recommendation number 2 yeah idara thambi idara pakkaradhu chat can you please explain policy recommendation number 2 Yeah. Yes, yes. The policy recommendation number two is on the inclusiveness. So it is a broader concept, like social justice. Uh, if we talk about inclusiveness, uh, one can say that one, uh, one can say that. humanitarianism development and peace building actors should be encouraged to be very positive in their thinking and in their actions so that the base towards the inclusive led initiatives will be possible otherwise uh it will not be possible at all uh, in this uh, context we can have partnerships among the countries also or we can have partnerships among the state governments uh, which will be uh, very uh, useful to have collaborative thinking or it will be very possible to collaborate the problems and issues related to covid 19 and after collaborating and having discussions thoroughly among the cohorts we can uh, find out some concrete solutions which can be uh, employed in practice so this is about policy recommendation number two, inclusive led initiatives we have to have uh, all the Uh, stakeholders in one sense uh, in terms of food security and uh, uh, food systems uh, take for example uh, starting from farmers and uh, <clears throat> merchants and dealers even uh, retailers and the consumers we uh, should have some inclusiveness this is for an example but as i have already uh, told you inclusiveness is not a very very uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, basic concept uh, each and every one can understand we can understand this concept only when we are ready to accept the social justice. otherwise it will not be possible for inclusiveness only when the people who are ready to accept social justice they are brought to uh, 
local initiatives which are inclusive in nature if you are not satisfied other uh, can also compliment me or supplement me thank you uh well, thank you madam yeah uh, thank yes. you professor uh, uh, do we have any other questions audience okay uh, not so like let me uh, conclude this session uh, thank you professor uh, dr sadashivam uh, we have made us clear that uh, food and uh, nutritional security is the uh, main outcome of sustainable food system and uh, however uh, food insecurity and malnutrition is still affecting uh, of the global population and also like i have suggested uh, a couple of suggestions in, uh, including being uh, uh, inclusive uh, providing social security measures and uh, uh, other suggestions you made across hope the policy makers uh, take note of it and provide us uh, better solutions uh, in strengthening uh, food and nutrition status of our nation uh, thank you professor sadashiv for joining us and enlightening us in every your talk Thank, thank you, you arun and uh, your team for having given me this golden opportunity to share my views thank you very much thank you thank you thank you professor thank you thank you sir um so moving on to our uh, next talk that's on impact of covid 19 on zero hunger goal indian perspective we have dr gopinath r gopinath and i request arun sir to kindly introduce gopinath Uh, first of all, let me welcome Dr. Kopinath uh, to our seminar. He is a very good friend of mine, and uh, I don't know how many of you know this fact that he is uh, both of us are classmates. Okay, fine. Uh, Dr. Kopinath is a principal scientist with the uh, MS Swaminathan the Research Foundation. He has a doctoral degree in developmental economics, and has more than 15 years of uh, work experience in both research and developmental. activities this core area of specialization on uh, food and nutritional security and uh, agrarian transformation he actively engages himself in research on rural transformation programs uh, monitoring and evaluation of community based initiatives policies and programs and is also closely associated with implementation of uh, action research at the field level for uh, food and nutrition security and engages in policy advocacy uh, advocacy for upscaling innovation in uh, agriculture and uh, uh, that's all about him and uh, welcome back to gopinath and the uh, stage is yours uh, we are eagerly waiting for tourism uh, fever speech copy okay. thank you very much uh, dr aru uh, thanks a lot for this uh, nice introduction and uh, giving this great opportunity to uh, interact with uh, academic community the one which i rarely have uh, that's my need you to an edge of work that i am doing am i audible arun yes yes dr gopinath like you are yeah. you can hear it i i i have this cold so, so my voice may not be that much uh, audible please bear with me uh, the team convenience okay no, so, not at all can i share yes yes huh? okay yes sir yes uh, dr gopinath you can start So this is again about uh, the impact of uh, covid-19 on uh, so not like a zero hunger which is very much related with uh, what dr sadha shivam uh, explained so far so uh, i am happy to uh, i mean I listen such a uh, such an elaborative lecture given by a senior professor because uh, he set the tone Uh, to discuss about this food and nutrition security yeah. his explanations are more the theoretical base and one can clearly understand the concepts of food and nutrition security if you closely observe his uh, lecture so this is something like uh, a more application side uh, and of course uh, since i am in the uh, uh, implementation part i would like to share how this uh, uh, covid-19 measures uh, impact at the ground level uh, across the country but i feel uh wait wait yes 
Before we go to uh, the, uh, analyze this impact, uh, I would like to re-insist uh, this particular point. When we say SDG2, zero hunger, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, ensure uh, uh, nutrition. It has a lot of other things. That is end hunger, achieve food security, improve nutrition, and promote sustainable agriculture. So when we say zero hunger, it's a, it's a, it's a holistic term that covers all aspects of food and nutrition security. So that's why the targets are also set like that. So the, the targets are, first one is uh, end hunger and ensure access by all people, uh, particularly poor and vulnerable communities, uh, including infants, to save nutritious and sufficient food all the year around. So this is very particular. When we say end hunger, it should ensure access by all people to safe, nutritious, and sufficient food all uh, year around. There should not be any seasonal hunger. Okay. And the second target is end all form of formal nutrition. That is, uh, we need to address stunting. That is, uh, stunting is nothing but uh, inadequate uh, uh, height to age. Okay. Wasting. Wasting is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, inadequate weight to height. We generally call that one as underweight, but technically that is waste. Okay. And uh, among the children under five years, uh, or six to uh, uh, another one, uh, this one, uh, for 49 months. And additional, uh, address the nutritional needs of adolescent girls pregnant and back-taking women and old persons. So when we say end malnutrition, it should be uh, all forms of malnutrition should uh, get end by that time, okay? Then the third one is very important. This comes under supply side. The double the agricultural productivity and incomes of small-scale uh, food producers, which are very much associated with what Professor Sadasivam explained, availability and access to food. The access to food decided by the purchasing power of the community. And a country like India, where uh, around the three fourths of your rural population, depending on agriculture in one or the other way, the access very much decided by the income generated from agriculture. So that's why uh, this particular goal emphasizes a need for doubling agriculture productivity and incomes of small scale food producers. Okay. Why the small-scale fruit producers are important? Because if you take the cultivators in, in the country, 86% uh, of them are small and marginal farmers. They're cultivating less than two hectares, or in other words, less than five acres. Okay. It is very much essential to double their income. Then only we can ensure uh, adequate purchasing power of their hands, which will go uh, or uh, two other sectors and uh, economists have already calculated that the multiplier effect of the money in the hands of small and marginal farmers are not four, but more than four, okay? And the fifth one is, I mean, uh, the fourth one is ensure sustainable food production systems and implement resilient agricultural practices. So when you say sustainable food production systems, uh, the, 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 the resources should be exploited in a way that it should not affect future generation. That's where the scientific farming comes. It can be your traditional farming, organic farming, or inorganic farming, but you have to optimally utilize your natural resources. You have to scientifically use your natural, natural resources. That's how this, uh, for the second part, that implement resilient agricultural practices are also come. Huh? That in a way to increase productivity and production, yes, this increasing productivity is a non-compromising uh, uh, word for a country like India. I tell you why it is very much essential for a country like India. So whatever technology you introduce, so as to our farming systems you follow, a production should not get sacrificed. Then only you can ensure adequate product. I mean, productivity should not get sacrificed. Then only you can get more production, which will give more income to farmers. And we need to maintain ecosystems, strengthen capacity for adaptation to climate change. 
so the, the community which are depending on this nature and agriculture predominantly we need to enhance their adaptability to climate change so here the requirement is mitigation from government and implementing agencies but we need to capacitate community on adapting this climate change in a different way say something like uh, uh, awareness on uh, uh, climate change uh, related things and also alert them well before uh, any uh, natural calamity kind of thing okay <coughs> that's what other parts are explain and improve land and soil quality of course those two things are very much essential for any uh, production enhancement or crop diversification whatever it is so we need to progressively improve land and soil quality and the fifth and important one is maintain the genetic diversity of seeds which will be essential for ensuring sustainable food production systems a uh, cultivate plants and farm and domesticated animals and their related wild species so it is something like and uh, i mean zero hunger doesn't mean uh, it ends with uh, nutrition alone it has complete production systems which will ensure adequate nutrition in the community if you see all the five targets set by united nations you can clearly see how this uh, adequate and nutritious food availability across the throughout the year is important and how to uh, end all forms of malnutrition and importance of doubling productivity agricultural productivity and incomes of smaller marginal farmers and essentials to ensure sustainable food production systems and we need to uh, the, and the importance of maintaining the genetic diversity of seeds then only we can bring any crop diversity or even diversity within each crop okay so all these things together contribute zero hunger this is very much essential okay but when it comes to india the niti aayog the primarily responsible department to ensure uh, sdg attaining sdg in the country they identified seven indicators to measure progress of attaining the zero hunger that is nothing but sdg 2 goal number 2 all these seven indicators they identified based on the data availability in the country okay it's not like the seven indicators completely measure but it is something like many indicators developed by united nations or something uh, we don't have a data to measure all those things so they finalized the seven indicators which covers all those five aspects broadly hmm? one is percentage of beneficiaries covered under national food security act through which a government uh, implements public distribution system icds mdms and also provide minimum support prices to farmers okay the target is 10% and according to the dashboard available with the niti aayog that is 2020 data based dashboard you can simply understand the current uh, status of india to achieve this target that is 99.51% it's basically implementation related thing the second important indicator is percentage of pregnant women age 15 to 49 years or in other words a reproductive age group who are anemic anemic is something like uh, having many factors responsible for this one but generally we know it's iron deficiency but it's not iron deficiency alone okay so it's an important indicator ratasoga in tamil it's an important indicator to ensure healthy pregnant women okay and health, healthy pregnant women only can give health, healthy child so that's why this addressing anemia uh, uh, anemia among pregnant women is getting importance the, the, the target uh, for us is 25.2 but at present the, the prevalence level is 50.4% in other words every second A pregnant women is getting anemic okay you can see where are we now the third one is yes production related rice and wheat produced annually per unit area that is uh, kg per hectare why they take rice and wheat is something like if you take total cultivated area in the country 
more than 63 percentage of cultivated area are under rice and wheat so whatever we are uh, uh, we 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 talk about this crop diversification or whatever it is still rice and wheat are the predominant crops so therefore they set this target and fix a target something like 5322.08 kg per hectare that is the target but at present our achievement level is 2995.21 kg per hectare and the fourth one is again about this nutrition a percentage of children under 5 years who are underweight underweight is not having adequate weight to your age okay not weight to your height it is weight to your age that they measure among the children between 6 months to 59 months the are in other words 6 months to 5 years okay before they celebrate fifth birthday the target is 1.9% but present level is every third child is underweight this global hunger index you know that global hunger index takes this indicator also to measure the hunger index so 33.4% is the current level a percentage of children under 5 years who are stunted that i already uh, told you that the stunted children are those who are not having adequate height to weight target is 6 but present level is 35 this stunt stuntedness can come down in the long run only uh, that's why they take this stunted up, uh, also as an indicator uh, to measure a country's progress and adolescent uh, age of 10 to 19 years who are anemic is this age group is very important because this age group will goes to a reproductive age group after some years and the only available data at present is cnns data comprehensive national nutrition survey data which is very much available uh, in the web box that is collected by government of india the target is 14 but our present level is 28.4% and the seventh one is a very much important for a Uh, people like you and me who are studying economics it's gross value added in agriculture per worker it's not gross domestic product gross value added is nothing but uh, the total value of outputs minus value of intermediate consumption or in other words inputs uh, value of inputs total value of outputs minus total value of inputs so that is called gross value of out uh, gross value added in agriculture uh, so that that per worker measures uh, the income generated uh, from agriculture the uh, thing is target is 1.22 lakh per worker per year but as of now our uh, uh, our achievement is 0.71 percent some 0.71 lakhs only or in other words 71000 here you should understand that this is an average there are inequalities within agricultural communities so i can give an example i told you that 86 percentage of farmers are small and marginal farmers but if you see the proportion of land with them is not even 50 percent so remaining 14 percentage of farmers are having more than 50 percentage of lands all those outputs are also coming under this consideration so this figure won't give you that inequality within the the differences among the different classes however we are still far again uh, far below than the uh, uh, our than the target okay so these are the five indicators seven indicators considered by government of india to track our progress to achieve this zero hectare okay the previous slide explains the uh, the target given by the international community whereas this one Uh, explains you the indicators considered by government of india to achieve this sdg 2 then now we go to uh, the next phase what happened to this uh, sdg during this pandemic is but if you want to understand the impact of this uh, covid 19 on uh, indian population we should understand some key features that 90 percentage more than 90 percentage of our laborers are in informal sector that means the employment conditions are not formalized 
they are not in salaried employment employer salaried employee categories they don't have paid leaves their jobs are not secured yes you and me can also claim that our jobs are not secured and we can be sued at any time but if you take those 90% of laborers who are doing a daily basis workers or contract workers their uh, employment is completely insecure if you if they take leave they have to forego the wages they don't know whether tomorrow or next week they get uh, employment or not so that kind of insecurity is very much existing among the uh 90% of labor force in the country and 80% of this 90% now it take 90% as 100 80% of them are earning less than 15000 per month this is what periodic labor force survey uh, from national statistical organization gives so one is 90% of them are in informal sector the other one is 80% of them are earning less than 15000 per month that means those households are barely having any savings in their hands to meet any immediate employment loss the class can come in any form for any reasons like this shutdown okay so we know that uh, this is uh, this uh, directly affects the access to food because it affects the employer uh, purchasing power okay then this jst uh, rakhnandan from international food policy research institute that if free she calculated that 63 to 76% of our rural people could not afford a recommended diet that is based on 2011 12 data so these are all pre covid situation remember that these two features are pre covid situations okay so one third to nearly one third to more than one fourth of our rural population could not afford a recommended diet recommended diet means a balanced diet where the, the diet should have all four group of fruits and vegetables should have adequate nutritious cereals pulses animal protein vegetables you can talk all these things to less than one fourth of population because more than one fourth of your population are not afford to it that is the situation last week i have attended an fao uh, unfortunately the country like india we don't have that uh, data but bangladesh they measured that uh, a balanced meal cost is something like 2 dollar 60 cents india can also be something like that that means two dollars with the present value is more than 160 rupees a balanced diet may be cost 150 to 160 rupees okay if you uh for this uh jesse ragnandan uh, this thing is uh, calculation is based on the 2011 12 nsso data more than one third of uh, one third and uh, uh, one fourth of our uh, uh, this one all right, uh, two thirds or uh, three fourth of our uh, rural population are not afford affordable to this recommended diet. So this is the situation. So in this situation, we have this problem, COVID nineteen problem. So then you assume how can we attain that uh, targets set by uh, SDG uh, companies? Okay, SDG group. Okay, I prefer to call it as a company like uh, uh, this one. Um, what uh, Cuba's Fidel Castro criticized this uh, this uh, Millennium Development Goals in 1995. You should have read his speech made in that uh, uh, UN in 1995 uh, on criticizing this Millennium Development Goals. But however, we have SDG. We are committed to attain this SDG. So we have to measure our progress uh, towards attaining this SDG. So with this. The employment loss occurred among this 90 percentage of people due to this COVID-19 related uh, induced restrictive measures. Okay. This directly affects the nutritional status. Okay, I need not give any example, but I can give only one thing that is given by, uh, I mean, studied by Azim Premji University in 2020. Uh, they found that 77 percentage of households were consuming less food than before. That means then previous pre-COVID period. 
and 66% last employment. They have conducted this survey among 12 major states in the country. So 77% consumed less than what they're supposed to consume. And 66% of households lost their employment. You, you can just relate this one with uh, Jesse's uh, calculation that she did in 2020. Okay. And in this one, uh, Government of India introduced something like uh, Prime Minister Pratham Mandri Garbi Kalyan Yojana. I'm so sorry if I pronounce uh, in a wrong way because I don't know Hindi. Okay. P it's not my problem. PMGKY. Okay. Under PMGKY, government provided additional 5 kg of grinds and 1 kg pulses per household and somewhere. For, for at free of cost to, to those who have this priority uh, 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 households card or non-priority households, so whatever it is. If they have a card, they are eligible to get this one. But this measure assures availability of food grinds or either wheat or rice at the household level, but not a balanced diet, remember. And they also says that 1,000 rupees for some months, other things. So 1,000 rupees is nothing. If you take this uh, 150 or something, 1,000 rupees is nothing hmm? for a household having four members. Okay. So oh, this, this PMGKY or state measures prevent hunger deaths, not ensure nutritious food at the household level. That's the point. And uh, the government immediately after this uh, lockdown announced in uh, last week of uh, March, they immediately, I mean, after two, three weeks, they started distributing dry rations to uh, school going children and uh, ICDS uh, beneficiaries uh, across the country. Tamil Nadu uh, was the one state which started this uh, dry ration distribution to ICDS workers well before uh, they get this instruction from. Government of uh, India, even Tamil Nadu distributed eggs also. Okay. The problem is with this uh, uh, this thing. Uh, the, in the present context, the societal societal pattern, you can't ensure that these dry rations reach needy people. Takes take an example. If a pregnant woman is there in the household, and her uh, first child uh, doing second and third standard, that, that pregnant woman gets uh, these directions from ICDS, but she may not take that food. She may give that food to her school-going children, huh? other children's, school-going child or other children's. The same way, if you give the direction to a uh, uh, young female child, you can't assure that that goes to that female child only. There is a greater chance to, uh, to I mean, get that uh, dry ration by male child in the same household. That's that's a, that's a kind of society where we are living. So it is something like, yes, we distributed that uh, dry ration. That's what this uh, implementation agency claims. Okay. The point is measures announced to uh, help people to eat food during this uh, uh, lockdown period ensures only availability of food at the household level, not a healthy food. Okay, because they lost employment, completely lost employment, particularly these uh, informal sector people. And you started this MG and RGS work after three, four months. The first three, four months uh, were very, very, very crucial period that has that shown impact on the nutritional part in the later stage. And yes, it's still uh, government has um, followed uh, uh, this uh, targeted public distribution system. Even after having this severe crisis, they yet to universalize that public distribution system. You take this state like Tamil Nadu, where the government implemented universal system, it's a self-selection to come out of that system. You can see significant proportion of households are not having up, uh, not having a rise from the previous shop. It's a self-selection. We ourselves declared that we don't want rice. We can take only uh, 
oh, uh, this one, sugar or something. But if you implement this targeted public distribution system, where you don't have clear measure for uh, poverty line, the error of exclusion is more than the error of inclusion. That's what these uh, people like uh, Zondri, Sandeep, all uh, argue that you go for universal public distribution system, particularly in this pandemic led crisis period, let people themselves decide whether they buy this grain or not. Okay. This is getting important because FCA reported that uh, grains are mounting in the goodons. If grains are there in the buffer stock or goodons, uh, above or more and uh, over and above the, the buffer stock, then the operational cost of FCA goes, on, goes up. Whatever subsidies you are climbing at a food subsidies, most of them goes to maintain those grains at the godowns not distributing those subsidies completely to public. Okay, so one side people are suffering to get adequate uh, food. On the other side, grinds are mounting in the FCA, which will further increase that maintenance cost. Okay, that means you are keeping materials away from the open market, which will have impact on the prices of those quantum of grains available in the market. The market price will increase because you are taking some supply from the market. Okay, that's how you address that gap. So <clears throat> the measures announced by government during this pandemic period are something like uh, not, not adequate, are uh, not ensuring nutritious food availability at the household level. This is a story of one particular part that is nutrition related part. Because so the, the, the lesson is no nutritious food, no assurance on nutritious food availability at the household level in a condition where people already suffered to attend the nutritional status and also already suffered to get nutritious meal because of its high cost. Okay. The other part of this zero hunger uh, goal is production system. That is what type of agricultural uh, production you have, how to produce all those things. But if you want to understand the production system, you need, you need to understand some key features of this, uh, that the community who are involved in this production. I have already told you that 86% of farmers are small and marginal. Hmm? And if you take that recent NSSO data that was released in 2018-19, uh, average monthly income of farm household, it was only 10,218 during any crop year. And this income, they derived by having total value of output minus total cost. What they considered as cost is something like cost actually farmers paid out from that package. It's not imputed cost for the family land. It's not imputed cost. It's not covered imputed cost of those family labor and own production materials. So it's simply a paid out cost based calculation. Even still, the average income is 10,218 per family, per household to a farming household in the country. And even if you see this 10,000, 4,000 rupees are from wages. And some 100 rupees are 134 from leasing out their land. Receipt from crop production is merely not even 4,000 rupees. It's 3,798 rupees. And net receipt from uh, animal farming is 1,500, 1,600 rupees. And net receipt from non-farm business is 641 rupees. So the, here the lesson is, if you take one farm household in the country, that household gets wage income. Remember that the, the wage income received by that farm household is more than the crop income, their own crop income. 
you see that net receipt from crop production is 3,798, but income from wages are 4,063. So whatever that the farm house you call that the farm households are not completely based on their own farm for their uh, survival. They get more income from non-farm uh, activities, including wage, animal farming, all those things. So this is the situation. And more than three fourth, I, I told you already. Hmm? Uh, and uh, po, 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 more than 66% of lands are under wheat and rice cultivation. So this situation, you are setting a target, so something like a resilient production system, sustainable production system, okay? And you are measuring growth of these farming households in, uh, I mean, uh, in the in the indicator, something like gross value added in households. The other thing is, uh, we observed that the missing link with the supply chain of quality inputs. If you go to any corner of these countries and enquire, I mean, have a detailed discussion with the farmers, the one very big reason given by farmers is non-availability of quality seed for any product. If you promote a certain climate resilient and uh, a well, uh, high, uh, high yielding uh, variety seeds nowadays, immediately farmer question is where this seed is available. Because this, this smaller margin of farmers, they may not travel more, travel uh, for long distance to get quality seeds. Whatever seeds you are promoting that should be available within that uh, reachable area, maybe within that five to six kilometers. But the, 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 the supply of those quality materials is inadequate or it's not stable. So the biggest problem is supply chain quality, uh, supply chain of these quality inputs that include seeds, uh, even these organic inputs. I can give you example from this organic inputs. So you are promoting organic inputs in a very big way, both uh, union government and also state governments. But if a farmer is not producing it, if the farmer wants to apply that organic uh, input into their land, into his, his or her land, the availability is a very big problem. You cannot buy Jivamruth in a nearby market the way you buy urea. The, 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 oh, the many such, uh, what do you say, this uh, Panchakavya. You just inquire about the availability of Panchakavya in the market. That's what our, our one of our uh, small research done in uh, Assam says. The women, trained women farmers prefer to apply uh, organic inputs in their own boro rice uh, cultivating area. But they find that the availability of this Panchakavya and Jivamrut are very big issues. Even this... Uh, uh, yellow sticky trap to avoid pest attacks. Those things are not available in the nearby market. They have to travel 50 to 60 kilometers to district headquarters to buy these inputs. So we need to ensure that quality inputs supply to smaller marginal farmers in a nearby area. The second important thing for uh, people like uh, us is yield gap and the existence of yield gap among major crops. Yield gap is nothing but the difference between actual yield and the potential yield. Potential yield doesn't mean that you are comparing your, I mean, doesn't mean that potential of the particular seed yield in any part of the country. Nothing like that. That also, also we generally feel that you are comparing your Indian average yield with the Japanese yield that is called yield gap. Nothing, nothing like that. You take any seed, okay? Take any, say, IR20 seed in paddy. If you want to test, if you want to apply that particular variety in a Chengalpattu district, you are testing that particular variety's potential yield in that nearby agriculture research station or Krishi Vinyan Kendras, where you have a similar ecosystem. Climatic uh, zone, it is coming under the same climatic zone, you have a same ecosystem, agroecological situation. So that the, the agriculture scientists test this seed. They measure uh, 
productivity of that particular variety of that particular area. Then they distribute that seed into farmers in Chengalpattu district. And farmers get that, uh, I mean, realize certain yields. The difference between a yield attained at the research institute and the actual yields from the farmer's land, farmer's land is called yield gap. The yield attained at the research institute, I mean, in a controlled situation, or in other words, research institute, that is potential yield. That means the seed can give that much yield. The actual yield is what the farmers actually realize in their own land. So if the difference between this potential and actual yield is huge, generally the actual yield is less than the potential yield, not generally, in most all cases. If the difference is huge, that means your farming is not viable one. You are not cultivating that particular crop scientifically to get maximum yield. Unfortunately, India, the potential yield for both wheat and rice is huge. This, I get this one from FAO, uh, uh, this one, FAO's uh, uh, document. And it is observed that you take year one, year two, year three. This is very much economic. It's not agriculture one. We, we, we economists should do this kind of, uh, this one, analysis. So, so I prefer to present this one to this crowd rather outside as even agriculture university people. So observe this one, See, year one, year two, year three. Okay, year one, year two, year three. This is your potential yield. This dark one is your potential yield for wheat. You see, your actual yield is this much. Your potential yield is this much. The gap is yield gap. If you see other countries, say Germany, the wheat yield gap is very minimum. Ethiopia, gap is very high. Tanzania, because these countries are major, I mean, major producers in terms of wheat production is concerned. France is relatively low. You take China, this gap is relatively lower than the Indian one, if you take it in a proportion format. So your yield gap can be comparable with some African countries, not with the, the so-called developed countries. In Denmark, it is almost nil. Okay, our, our yield gap should be something like this. Then only you can say that uh, the farmers are realizing uh, better income because the, the, the income is from their own production only. And you see this rice. Rice is also something like this. So it is very much clear that yield gaps for major crops are very high in the country. That means you have a greater potential to exploit your own seed quality, uh, seed production. Okay, exploit your own production in a more scientific way. And the prevalence of unscientific farming is very much existing. I don't want to again produce some statistics from uh, NSSO's 2018-19 survey, which clearly says that very, 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 very uh, mean, I mean, less than 10 percentage of farmers are getting uh, scientific advisories from any sources, including government and private sources. That means farmers are cultivating with their own knowledge and also what the knowledge that they get from other farmers. That means that need not be a scientific one. That is a major reason for more application of fertilizers, pesticides, unscientific application of fertilizers and pesticides, which cost for very high cost of production. Hmm? All these things are associated with your uh, zero hunger goal that we should remember. Huh? That's how we, we, we discuss all these things and lack of access to remunerative prices. I tell you what kind of marketing system we have now and lack of public investment. See, whenever we discuss about investment in agriculture, we forget to discuss one particular point in detail. When public investment declines, private investment increases in agriculture. A simpler term, you can understand that if surface water through canal is not available, farmers are forced to go for groundwater supplementation. That means digging well and having more bore wells. Investment on those wells and bore wells are coming under private investment. Because of the lack of public investment to, to ensure water available in all lands, farmers forced to go for their own investment. That is private investment. When private investment is more, 
you can't even imagine about this resilient climate change sustainable agriculture immediately farmers prefer to go for uh, income i mean crops that provides more income you can't even imagine the sustainable agriculture practices there in the land where this private investment is high that's why uh, farmers prefer this irrigation intensive crops crops immediately when they dig a bore or invest more uh, in a particular land so unless you increase this private investment public investment you can't think about this uh, uh, i mean climate resilience uh, varieties or sustainable agriculture activities which are a targets under this uh, zero capital and accumulation of non agricultural capital in agriculture by individuals other than small and marginal farmers this i don't know how many of you are understand but uh, this is the uh, emerging issue in a country like india you can do a simple analysis uh, you 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 just estimate rate of return from a particular piece of land and also price of that particular land nowadays you can see the mismatch between uh, rate of return and the prices of lands are increasing and the gap between these two things are widening uh, across the state and across the districts as well if you go to any rainford area prices of lands are increasing the lands are actually under barren not cultivated even if you go to an agriculture completely agricultural land you can see that the land prices are increasing that means proportion of rate of return that explains lands value has declined the proportion of factors that not associated with the return on land has increased to fix that particular lands prices a demand for that land for various reasons and accumulation of non agricultural capital from outside that villages outside that country and dump those capital into that land you know in their own natives are getting increased that's why that land prices are increased that means small and marginal farmers may not think about buying new lands in uh, uh, in, in 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 a present situation i uh, i bought a land uh, for in 20 2014 uh, one acre of land uh, prices were 3 lakhs rupees in in the head reach of uh, kaveri delta in tanjore now the particular land value is 12 lakhs i am getting a same return from that particular land it's a simple example to understand this particular point so 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 you are you are you are you are uh, you, are, you are the, the productive uh, factors particularly lands are moving away from small and marginal farms that is the story from this one and this is the yield gap that i already explained and uh, yes if you want to ensure sustainable agricultural practices if you want to ensure uh, diversity in seed production the goal number 4 and 5 that means target score and 5 you need investment on research and innovation in agriculture but how much investment actually made in india on agriculture research is not even 0.3 percentage of agriculture gdp remember the sub saharan countries are investing more than our country on the agriculture research and is investing 0.62% i get this figure from ramesh and dorkin paper for this niti ayog so he himself accepted he himself raised this issue so you see this sub saharan in south africa they invest 2% of their uh, uh, gdp on agriculture research whereas you are not even touching this 0.5% your next competitor is china but because of its size china's actual amount is huge hmm? <clears throat> and this international agriculture research expenditure intensity ratio this we call it as intensity ratio intensity ratio is very much low in your country so if the investment is low on research and innovation you can't expect more innovations you can expect more uh, uh, research or uh, research outputs from this particular sector so that will be reason for not not attaining those two, those uh, uh, sub targets four and five and with this one i would like to add some more masala to our presentation masala in terms of uh, sharing my field experiences 
of survey that I have conducted among six uh, states uh, during this lockdown. Okay, so I call it as masala because it gives you some fresh information from the field that we can uh, relate with uh, the overall observations. So one is this, uh, we observed that uh, when uh, Government of India announced uh, lockdown in March 2020, agriculture situation is not same across the state, even across the district as well. The paddy cultivation was ongoing in Puducherry and Velupuram, whereas it was harvested in the Tanjavur and Pudukotai. And uh, pulses cultivation uh, was just started in Tanjavur and Pudukotai, whereas it was in the harvesting state at uh, Puducherry and Velupuram areas. And boro rice cultivation was just, uh, I mean, land preparation was ongoing in Assam. Uh, uh, as some for this boro rice, whereas uh, Ganjam and Katak districts in Odisha, they just uh, uh, they were in the cultural operations to apply pesticides and fertilizers in the rice cultivation. So it was something like that. So so whenever you take any particular uh, point of time, the agriculture situation across the country is not uniform. So impact may not be uniform. Impact may be in different forms. You need labor in one part of the country. You need inputs for ongoing operations in some other part. You need infrastructure and materials to market that produce, harvest, market that produce. You need machineries for land preparation, other things. So requirements are diversified across the country. And uh, uh, with this one, this uh, COVID-19 restrictions were announced without any relaxation for uh, agricultural activities in the initial period. You know what happened? Farmers paid extra money for harvesting. Even we, 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 we observed that few farmers harvested whatever possible using their own family labor. They left land as it is. In Korapur district of Orissa, farmers harvested that uh, uh, pulses, maize and pulses with their own family labor and they left land as it is. They lost their uh, produce and farmers in uh, po, po, this one uh, the po, Assam they were not able to get uh, tractors I tell you a story about the, um, about the women farmers in that area okay even uh, when when women farmers approached the local uh, power tiller operators to get missionaries their reply was something like even we were not able to supply male farmers how come you approach us? You are not at all our priority now. So that kind of problems are faced by farmers, particularly women farmers. They were not in the priority list. Women farmers find it difficult to move to, I mean, go to nearby markets to buy inputs. The Korapo, the Ganjam district farmers bought inputs, I mean, one, one bag of urea by paying 150 rupees extra. And they were not able to buy insecticides. All those things, okay? If you were in a position to produce your own uh, organic inputs, you are saved. But among the two, 350 farmers that I surveyed in all these uh, states, only one farmer reported that she was able to produce uh, organic menus. So we were given training to all farmers, almost to 200 farmers across the states. Okay, even if you want to produce organic uh, inputs, you need some organic uh, fertilizers, bio uh, inputs, you need some raw materials. Those raw materials were not available at that time. So the other major area is repairing the machineries that is available in the villages. Mechanics were not available. Mechanics were finding it difficult to move to other villages. So complete entire operations got disrupted. Hmm? So, the other thing is, I feel the, the another dimension of this agriculture production, when we talk about the sustainable agriculture practices, income is income realized by farmers through the producers. So double income of small and marginal farmers. That's why that was part of your sub target. Okay. So if you want to realize better income, you need to have better marketing facility. But what kind of marketing facility you have now? That the density of APMCs, agriculture producing marketing company uh, committees in the country, it, it is from Standing Committee on Agriculture, uh, Government of India as well. Hmm? It's something like uh, uh, 
6,630 APMCs available in the country. And average distance between two APMCs is uh, uh, 12 kilometers. You assume a farmer in between. Farmer has to travel six kilometers on an average. It varies from state to state. Take Tamil Nadu. It is 12 kilometers. You should remember that this particular 26, I mean 283 includes primary marketing yards and, and sub-marketing yards. If you remove the, the sub-marketing yards, the situation will be further pathetic. Okay. So, so the APMCs are not located nearby farmers to produce that market. So, how much? What is the norm? What is the norm to have APMCs in a country like India? This National Commission on Agriculture, that was in 1976, uh, for, for dated one yearly formed this National Commission on Agriculture. They suggested to have uh, APMCs within the range of five kilometers. At that time, we didn't have adequate transport facilities and infrastructure facilities. And therefore, this Commission on Doubling Farmers' Income that was constituted in 2013 under, uh, uh, I mean, 2014 uh, under Ashok Dalwais. This one had, they suggested certain measures, size of each market, su surrounding terrains, uh, clustering of farmers, all those things to measure, I mean, to I mean, come uh, all those things to uh, measure number of markets, number of kilometers per market yard. Okay, even still, they make this calculation and they find that the deficiency is sixty-six percent in India. But this is not unauthenticated uh, source data. You can very much go to Doubling Farmers Income website website and there the government of india's report is having this figure i just reproduced that one so volume number four it is absurd that this one is regulated markets available this one is market needed by geographical area that is based on the uh, this parameter size of each market surrounding terrain cluster uh, of farms so they have made some calculations huh? if you go by geographical area you need this much but this uh, Ashok Dalvai committee, they calculated that, say, for example, Andhra Pradesh, not 519, but Andhra Pradesh needs 435 uh, APMCs. But what they currently have is 48. The deficiency is 187. Like that, if you go to Tamil Nadu, Tamil Nadu has 283. Are they supposed to have 452? The deficiency is... 63%. I mean, I mean, one third, one third. So proportion of this one to this one is 62.6%, 63% only. So instead of 10%, you have only 63%. The deficiency level is one third. Something like India also, one third. Even if you remove this uh, Punjab and Haryana, then this deficiency level will be further go up. These states, Governments, both the central and the FCA and the state governments are having more marketing yards to procure wheat produced by farmers huh, to their FCA. That is not like favoring these farmers. Actually, if you want to distribute wheat across the country, you need to procure all those wheat produced in these particular areas. Wheat and rice, particularly rice. Rice procured by Haryana, Punjab, and certain parts of CUP. Because if you see the consumption pattern, this uh, group, I mean, these pockets, they are basically wheat consuming farm uh, community. So whatever rice they produce, they used to sell it in the market. So unless, uh, if you procure all those uh, rice produced in those markets, uh, in those areas, you can distribute to other areas, including Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu is also a deficit state, not a surplus state. Andhra is a surplus state. Tamil Nadu is not a surplus state. Kerala is not a surplus state. We depend on central pool to feed our own population through PDS. So if you want to distribute this rice into all other states, 
most of the states who are under deficit category, you need to procure maximum rice produced in Haryana, Punjab, certain parts of UP. So that's why FCA and state governments are having more markets in that area. Okay, but whatever it is, the deficiency is more than one third. So the kind of system you have, so you this marketing facilities and uh, uh, income realized to farmers clearly says that you are not in a position to achieve your SDGs. But the COVID further, I mean, uh, increase the uh, intensity of crisis in an agrarian sector. That's the part. And the other side is you are you are uh, the, the, the nutrition side is whatever measures you have annou uh, announced that ensures availability of food, not a nutritious food. And the measure the impact of this COVID nineteen on anemic uh, uh, anemia, underweight, wasting, all those things require some time. Okay, that's that's so those things will reflect after some time only. But if you see the latest data, NFHS file data, it's clear that more than one third of your population is centered, more than half of them are anemic. We can see from the dashboard. So the, 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 the impact will be more, and it is very much required to increase state expenditure. State means government expenditure on health, nutrition, and also agriculture. I, I purposely end before my time, and I give more time for this discussion. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mukinath sir, uh, you didn't end before you were allotted time. Like uh, you made a presentation for Thank one you. hour. Like you started like by two forty five. Like now ended your session. By oh, I started by three forty five. Thank you. Yeah, Thank fine. You. Three forty five to two hours. Like so it's one three hour like this. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and if you have I mean, participants, if you have any questions, you can arise to uh, Gopinath, the principal scientist from MSR. You can hear it from the house mode. Okay. Is the uh, go to guy to get your doubts clarified as far as agricultural economics is concerned? I don't want to uh, brief like what he uh, said for the last one hour. Like, uh, shoot your questions and get it uh, clarified from Gopinath. So he's Sir, going to be there for another 10 to 15 minutes. Sir, Who's I have that? a question. Yeah, yes, madam. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Sir, uh, today there is a lot of talk on organic food and all that. Yeah, organic mm. food also being uh, heavily priced, <sighs> normally grown ones. Uh, mm. Is this trend even sustainable? You also made a point that as far as agriculture is concerned, the yield is uh, the top priority. So, mm. does uh, going forward, does organic, um, getting organic entirely, is it even a possibility? Is it even sustainable? So, that's my question. Very critical question. Uh, it has uh, so many dimensions, but I would like to summarize uh, as much as possible. Man. It's mainly due to time. But yes, see, organic farming uh, is a sustainable means. It is in the hands of government. Unless you get a premium price for your produce, this organic farming may not be scaled up among small and marginal farmers. This has been practiced by a group of farmers who can be able to directly connect with the marketing companies or the direct outlets. Uh, and also many of them are uh, uh, semi-medium or medium and large farmers who convert a portion of their land into organic farm. If you want to scale up this one among the small and marginal farmers who are having less than five acres, you need to ensure quality input, timely input at affordable prices. Huh? But because you can't expect farmers to produce entire inputs by their own means. If you take Tamil Nadu, uh, only 25 percentage of uh, uh, farming uh, income is from far their own farming. 75 percentage of their income from non-farm. So the, 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 the occupation has already diversified. So you need to ensure quality input, timely input, premium price that is very much required. Premium price and scientific operation, organic scientific operation. Knowledge on this organic operation is very much limited among the common community. So you need to take steps to enhance the knowledge on organic uh, operations among farmers. 
and we have to ensure missionaries that should be available in the market you can't expect a, a laborers to do all those operations okay then only it can be sustainable from farmers perspective from producer i mean consumer perspective like you and me so this is something like organic uh, outputs are allied groups product as of now it, it has turned to if you go to any urban market rural market some pockets it is uh, 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 poor man uh, poor, poor people's uh, food but urban it is allied people's food but the problem is we have very 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 i can say there is no scientific evidence available that because of this organic uh, products continuous consumption this particular nutritional aspect has addressed kind of thing we have lack of scientific evidences so it is very much essential to generate scientific evidences on all these aspects but main thing is for people like our the, the economists like you and, you and me that we need to understand the political reason behind promoting this organic these things organic farming it should not be a substitute for uh fertilizers it should not be a reason for reducing fertilizer subsidy so we should analyze in that angle also okay thank you thank you sir uh, thank you gopi for uh, sharing your field experiences so, audience if you have any questions you can ask to gopinath sir uh, otherwise we need to let him go because thank you like thank you the schedule again Okay, yeah. like Gopi, like uh, uh, you can be free. Thanks for joining us, Gopi. Always. Sir. Thanks, sir. Uh, you, uh, <laughs> you can see you thank in uh, some thank other forum. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay, audience. Like uh, uh, our next next technical session is going to be there by uh, four four p.m. And in fact, like uh, chairperson for the technical session, uh, Dr. Anna Dore is uh, with us, and uh, uh, of course, Shobhana Madam, is, the repertory of the session is also there. and uh, we will deal with your ppts all those things and we will uh, start in uh, start the technical session in another point and uh, don't go anywhere uh, uh, mr anadari sir and shobhan madam will take charge of uh, the next uh, one hour or so okay sir anadari sir it's all yours sir from now on how many paper absent are ready now okay uh, Uh, before handing it over officially handing it over to uh, another sir and shobhana madam uh, if you are uh, participants if you are uh, ready with your presentation uh, you can come forward uh, megha mahajan are you there like you are the one who uh, asked me to give the first slot to you yes sir yes sir i'm i'm here sir good good uh, afternoon yes. sir yeah good afternoon yes sir i'm ready you are ready, ready. Yeah, ready. presentation yes sir okay okay what we will do is that like we will start from megha mahajan and whoever is interested to present their papers be ready with your uh, ppts be ready with your uh, connectivity everything like we will uh, start uh, the technical session uh, sir over to you sir over to you sir. okay uh, thank you good evening good evening friends uh, this is a uh, first technical session the first paper presenter from mega magajan from Which university is in Coimbatore? S R M. Coimbatore. Your time starts now. Okay. Yeah. Your time starts now. We can take four minutes. Okay, After sir. After two, three paper presentations, we have discussed for five minutes. Okay. You take four okay. minutes. After four minutes, one minute will give action for another one. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir. We can start now. Yeah. Good. Ah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My, the title of my paper is an alternative to plastics. Need for the sustainable environment. See, plastics are everywhere. Uh, it's a it's a world of plastics. So, like from clothes to electronics to food, wherever uh, we have plastic, because it has some good properties: light in weight, easy uh, available, cheap in cost. So, there are some properties of plastic. That's why we are dependent on plastic these days. But there are certain disadvantages too. Like it's it is non biodegradable. Hundred to thousand years it will there in the environment it will not decompose into you know the smaller molecules it is it is harming our uh, you know ocean seas animals 
and nowadays it was reported that the microplastics which is 5 mm 5 mm in size it is entering the food chain and enters the human blood even in human blood the microplastics are reported so even if you see the future in around 2050 the uh, plastic in oceans it is more than the number of fishes it is increased to 5% than the uh, five times increase than the uh, whatever now scenario is so plastic you know decomposition by three ways only recycling combustion and landfilling uh, combustion uh, recycling 9 percentage no, no, no. of plastics no, no, no. are recycled rest yeah. are actually landfilled and combustion so landfilling 50 percent of there is landfilling but still out of that the, these type of plastics a single use plastic which is the major concern which is of major concern of environment so if we can't recycle it we need to redesign it and the solution to this problem is bioplastic i'm working on this bioplastics because it is renewable it is 100% degradable and moreover after degradation it will go to the soil it will not harm causes you know chemicals and gases to the environment it will not uh, responsible for the release of the gases into the environment which will you know help in our global warming problem so even the bioplastics means as a name indicates bio means it is bio based means made up of from the living organisms these bioplastics in trends if you see the today scenario the global biodegradable polymers market it will increase to usd 3.7 billion to usd 9.5 billion uh for the you can you can say in the year of 2027 so it is increasing it is increasing at a cagr of 20.6 percentage so it is a polymer which can degrade into you know smaller components like water carbon dioxide biomass with the help of microorganisms but there are so many bioplastics are already there in the market which is you know like plant based or animal based but still they have certain limitation still government does not you know implement the rules and regulation in the usage of these bioplastics we have number of bioplastics still in the environment but they are not completely biodegradable still they are a threat or problem to the environment because of their biodegradability they need some industrial compo- uh, you know industrial uh, composting technology so still uh, but the main focus of mine is microbial biopolymer the microbial biopolymer is 100% biodegradable and it is very easy to degrade these into smaller components it will basically enrich the soil also but the problem is the production cost the production cost this if you see the diagram here this polymer which is like phb is the main you know uh, 100% biodegradable polymer which can we can get from the microorganisms if you see the statistical data the pha which i am talking about it is from microorganism we can isolate it is 100% biodegradable and it is only usage till in in you know just 1 to 2% in the total european bioplastic scenario it is just using 1 to 2 percentage of pha is using nowadays rest other bio uh, polymers they are starch based polyethylene tetracyclate uh, so these kind of these are chemically synthesized plastics bioplastics no doubt the base is bio based but some are biodegradable some are still non biodegradable and if you see the application part in this graph the more part of application is in packaging flexible packaging and the hard packaging so these kind of packaging in the packaging only in the food industry in the dairy industry in the food processing industry in the packaging only most of the plastics are used so now what is the like uh, solution to this problem like if i'm telling about microbial still so many limitations are there actually bioplastics play very important role in circular economy circular economy means like for example nowadays it's a linear economy means take make and waste so circular economic means whatever the waste you can recycle you can compost into some useful products so whatever biodegradable or bioplastics the food waste we, we which we will get we will separate the food waste and then we will treat it technologically we will whatever for example mobile phones the refrigerators whatever the plastic forms we can retreat it we can you know con- compost it in such a way that can we can use it into a you know useful products like composting for plant fertilizer we can make food items from that and so on so like you know uh, it's a it's a still research is going on and india is still struggling because of uh, so many uh, uh, cost is coming in between government rules because still 
still the definition of biodegradable bioplastic is is actually um, itself is a mystery so it is not clear whether it is biodegradable whether it is a bio based so we have to go on we have to search on this and there is a lot of scope in this area we can make an alternative to plastic there is a long way to go because every road has an end so uh, we can uh, uh, what we can do yes we can take responsibility cut disposable the plastics from your daily routine and clean up your reachable places recycle start your green bags and cloth bags because we people are the more you know we human beings are the more responsible animals on the earth so if we should take responsibility we can do other and research is still going on on the microbial polymers if microbial polymer still 1 to 2% is there if there is if we can increase the yield from microorganism because plant and animal polymers they have certain limitations restrictions we can't exploit plants and animals for our use so microorganism they are everywhere and these kind of microorganism are present in the waste resources industrial waste everywhere they are present and they are producing i am uh, i'm also researching on this uh, field in uh, on bioplastic and uh, let's take a pledge together to reduce reuse and recycle the plastic waste say no to plastics thank you and before going to uh, the before going to end this session i'm just can want to conclude that microbial bioplastic is the future of the plastics and it is 100% biodegradable if we can you know uh, do research and do you know uh, still research is going on if we can go in the right direction we will definitely find solution in the coming years and this polymer will be there in the market which is replacing the traditional plastics because this microbial polymers the properties of their them are similar to the traditional plastics only there is certain limitations but we can making by making compost by making you know uh, polymers uh, by blending of two three polymers we can make biodegradable plastic thank you so much thank you for your nice presentation next presenters any presenter ready for presenting next uh sir uh, good evening sir can you hear me oh uh, yes kuma yes sir sir uh, okay you evening. are from pondicherry university Pond pondicherry yes sir i am from pondicherry okay your time starts now we can present okay sir thank you sir uh, good evening everyone present here this is kuma assistant professor in dr ambedkar government law college pondicherry uh, today i am going to present a topic on Health jurisprudence in India and articulation of geriatric uh, determinants and challenges. So, before entering into my topic, I would like to give a small introduction about uh, that the relevance of this topic to this uh, present day uh, session. Uh, this is see sustainable development goals, SDG goals. Uh, they have stated so many goals, but one among them is like health. Health is the most important aspect for each and every uh, human being on this planet. but among them there are certain vulnerable groups vulnerable groups means those who cannot protect their rights on their own or those who cannot um, safeguard their rights on, on their own so it includes like children women uh, then um, people belonging to weaker sections and one more more one among one among them is senior citizens that is a persons of the other term for senior citizens is elderly or aged persons so these are the persons who cannot protect their rights on their own so uh, that's a reason health has been uh, has uh, uh, that that's a reason why we call them as vulnerable groups so how to protect the health of the vulnerable groups especially senior citizens that is the topic which i am going to uh, make a presentation uh, in this session see what is aging aging is a continuous or a biological process in this process during this process we can see that a person uh, grow, growing older means his uh, mobility gets reduced uh, well he will become a vulnerable person to uh, frequent health issues then reproductive uh, parts uh, becomes an a non functional all the some of the some of the examples of a person growing in uh, a person a person getting aged see what are the uh, what is the relevance of their health issues and the senior citizens when a person is like normal in the sense like he is hale and healthy he can save god his rights on his own but when a person is like uh, is not is not healthy when he is dependent upon uh, someone else how his rights his or her rights has shall, has to get protected 
generally during old age people feel uh, low de- people get depressed it may be due to their uh, loneliness or the abandonment status that abandonment occurs on because of the reason that they have been left alone by their children or their own kids okay. so now the problem is like how to uh, protect their health uh, generally senior citizens are prone to more uh, communicable as well as non communicable health issues but the problem is earlier days non communicable diseases are less in number but nowadays you can see that uh, after especially after covid 19 we can see all kinds of communicable and non communicable diseases not only for senior citizens it is getting increased for everyone of us so senior citizen is not an exception to it now what are the uh, like um, what is the status or health status of senior citizens in india if you take the uh, rural as well as uh, urban status in rural areas uh, if uh, whatever the status statistics that is available is if it as per statistics people living in urban areas are more prone to health issues when compared to people living in rural areas it doesn't mean that there are uh, 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 um, proper medical facilities or rural people are healthier thing is we have proper statistics for urban areas and we don't have proper statistics for rural areas so now if you see uh, the what are the initiatives that are taken by uh, health government in protecting the rights of the senior citizens is that there are uh, universal health coverage and government in fact has, has made a policy like in 1999 there is a policy for senior citizens even after that in, in the year 2010 also the planning commission has introduced so many welfare measures for senior citizens added to this in the year uh, 2007 itself the the parliament of india has passed a legislation that is the maintenance and welfare of parents and senior citizens act 2007 so and this is one of the uh, legislation which is being which made the moral responsibility of protecting or taking care of the health elders has been turned into legal responsibility so legal responsibility means now children are not given an option to either to protect or to take care of their elders they are they are uh, they are bound to do that res- uh, duty properly and one more thing is if you connected the topic uh, uh, the present day topic that is health care section 20 of the uh, so called legislation that is maintenance and welfare of parents and senior citizens act has stated clearly that health care of the elderly has to be taken care for by the state as well as by the state here state means that is by the government so in order to give proper uh, shape to this uh, provision government has passed a uh, government has framed so many uh, welfare measures schemes for the welfare of the elderly so even we have so many health insurance policies for the welfare of the elderly but the problem is all those health insurance policies health wealth uh, schemes what is happening is like they have it has its own limitations say for example certain health issues may, may not be covered and people suffering already suffering with comorbidities cannot make use of all those health insurance schemes so in addition to this now government has come forward to introduce like geriatric care in all the public hospitals so even then the senior citizens face issues like accessibility and affordability to health care so accessibility means one is they cannot go to hospitals or they cannot approach the primary health center on their own they need someone for their assistance due to their uh, decreased mobility and the other one is affordability we cannot expect though we have a geriatric care the government has established geriatric care in all the hospitals government hospitals we don't know how to what extent it is been functioning properly whether all medicines are provided with a free of cost and whether there is a proper uh, uh, trained nurse and nurses and doctors to take care of the elderly is a billion dollar question so in uh, people don't have people people very less number of people approaches government hospitals for uh, treat uh, uh, with regard to health care so they prefer to go for private hospital so if we go for private hospital a uh, hospital as uh, the, the most in- important problem is like financial issues though uh, p- people prefer to save money all those things are possible uh, for the persons working in organized sectors 
but if you take most of the people living in india are uh, belonging to unorganized sectors they don't have money to uh, to uh, for savings they don't have save save anything for their uh, age i mean the for their old age so uh, though there are schemes though there are welfare measures uh, with this spiraling in inflation all those things are not sufficient to meet the uh, requirements of the uh, senior citizens so i would like to, what i would like to conclude is that there are healthcare measures government initiatives in the in the form of policies schemes welfare measures even judiciary is also playing a vital role in protecting the rights of the citizens all those things are there but even then this is not up to the mark or this is not sufficient uh, in the present day context why i am using the word sufficient is not sufficient means that see once upon a time people uh, aged pe people who are uh, aged or less in number now it is uh, a, a, they are the population age to population is uh, is increasing day by day so for example 11.1 percentage of the uh, people living in india are aged it means though it appears to be very small in number actually they are uh, uh, over i mean they, they are uh, they are uh, number of persons percentage is more than uh, uh, children below 14 years of age it means they are more in number when compared to others other uh, sets of people that when that being the case it is a duty of the government or it is a duty of uh, all uh, the state to take uh, to provide proper health care to the senior citizens uh, i thank you for giving me this opportunity if you have any doubts uh, we will have a discussion thank you thank you nice presentation uh, any presenters ready to present your paper hello sir good evening sir this is lohanathan from central university of tamil nadu okay you are ready to present now yes sir okay go ahead good evening to one and all this is lohanathan psc scholar from department of economics central university of tamil nadu tiruvaru thank you for giving this opportunity i should thank the organizer committee for accepting my paper and allow me to present here my title is kanan scenario of healthcare sector in india and overview uh, before uh, get into the current scenario we have to touch covid 19 definitely the title of the seminar is on covid 19 crisis how far covid 19 has impacted the healthcare sector indian health sector has undergone several adjustment and reforms and we know has created new opportunity to address issues since it highlights market needs and the new introduction of telemedical medicine facilities has been introduced by after covid 19 even due to several lockdown measures we are not able to move out and approach medical and doctors we did through online so the technical telemedicine facilities has emerged as a massive increase and uh, overall health spending appeared to drop slightly by 2020 because due to lockdown measures same so lockdown has affected healthcare sector a lot and uh, faced several issues due to that and uh, history suggests that uh, usually when this pandemic outbreak happens we face mental health we fail to present most of the time people has mental health issues that like stress anxiety depression insomnia anger and fear etc regarding su sustainable development goal sustainable development goal number 3 that to good health and well being to ensure the healthy lives and promote well being for all ages so around 500 people 500 million people has affected due to covid 19 and 15 million deaths and 92% of countries has disrupted essential health services due to lockdown measures and uh, universal health care also affected uh, there are few other things happened during the covid 19 one is a global life expectancy has declined and immunization coverage has also declined and prevalence of anxiety and depressions has increased and surprisingly tuberculosis and malaria has increased the tuberculosis death usually declined from 2005 uh, 
but in 2020 it has increased this is a surprising fact from the covid 19 which will affect the healthcare sector and when we talk about communicable and non-communicable diseases when we see the graph that communicable diseases is usually under going decline state and non-communicable diseases usually goes under a poor trend actually after 2019 after pandemic in march happened that it completely drastically changed the scenario when we talk about the non-communicable disease and communicable disease uh, we have shot at that top 10 deaths due to different types of diseases like number one heart diseases uh, and two three four when you see the uh, right side picture you can see that some of the things has misplaced like for example we didn't expect that diabetes will come in top 10 it fall in number eight in 2019 similarly uh, neonatal disorders has declined there's a good sign from third place to fifth place and some of the disease has been upgraded like COPD from fourth to second and stroke four to third these are the some of the things that causes the communicable and non-communicable diseases secondly the main focus on healthcare expenditure among the different regions like when you talk about the different region when we see the global in left hand side when we see global is having 13 and 3 when we see india it's higher than that it clearly shows that the health expenditure on health from the indian population is high compared to the global level and right hand side is a positive sign that equity is increasing in healthcare from 2004 to 80 especially in inpatient care outpatient care and institutional delivery and and there is a graph which shows that how much public expenditure influence the out of pocket expenditure so if there is a small increase in public health expenditure can drastically reduce the out of pocket expenditure so when the government initiated to invest more on health expenditure it will lead to reduce the out of pocket expenditure then in right hand side it shows that clearly that state health expenditure and inpatient out of pocket expenditure so it has a drastically going down when there is an increase in per capita state health expenditure spending definitely there is a decline in out of pocket expenditure so what are the challenges faced by the health sector first thing is an inadequate access they don't have a proper medical professions lack of quality assurance insufficient health spendings more significantly they don't have a fund for r d one of the major concern is administration second is low budget compared to japan canada and france they are spending 10 percent of their gdp on public health care but in comparison india is spending only 2.1 percent in previous season, this is lesser than 2.1 percent they spent only one 1.2 percent then slowly it increased to 2.1 percent in 21 to 22 but when we compare with the neighboring state like bangladesh pakistan it's surprisingly they are spending at least three percent of their gdp so we should at least increase our public health expenditure then when we talk about the preventive care in india we don't give much priority to the preventive care so we should undervalued we should increase the value of preventive care we undervalued in india so it, it shows that we have to pay more attention to the preventive care the lack of medical research I, as i said before the r d has to increase and the fund should you know, get into the r d department for more experimental things the next one is, is policy making so in india the issue is the, not on the demand side basically it is on the supply side we don't have the proper medical professions nurse and stops and medical and infrastructure facility so we have to increase through policy next one is shortage of healthcare profession as i said uh, we don't have sufficient doctors to meet out our population india is short of six lakh doctors from the parliamentary presentation the scarcity of resources uh, apart from the healthcare professions we lack medicines, infrastructure, facilities, and other proper facilities. The other thing is when we talk about the budget, what are the budget factors that are going to affect in the future? Like Ministry of Health and Family Welfare has increased 16.5% of their 
union budget and uh, this is mainly for centrally sponsored public health programs and uh, secondly to improve the infrastructure for medical education and establish aims they are, they have raised the increase from 43% from the previous years the budget of human resource and health and medical research from 7500 7, crores to before they used to spend only 4800 so 56% of the budget has been increased from previous years so another one is like national health mission they have increased 1.2% from the previous funding the ayushman bharat pradhan mantri has revised an increase of only 0.2% and um, pm scheme the different different schemes for uh, national health mission health infrastructural things they have increased and uh, the last thing is like insurance to all, to offer the insurance scheme it will boost multi sectoral pandemic research and other things so government has to initiate the insurance for healthcare workers that was during 2021 it was like 2813 in 21 to 21 after that it declined to 226 crores there is a reduction of 72 percent and uh, ensure the biodiversity so Aishman Bharat Health Infrastructure has to improvise under the One Health platform. So they have allocated 690 crores. Some of the recommendation and policy suggestions, uh, India must increase the accessibility and affordability. And uh, during the COVID-19, the mental health is um, a big issue. So they have to focus more on mental health. And uh, there is a simultaneous need for research and development. And uh, meanwhile, the flexible health system, at least one word may should be Alter to handle the public health emergency and the inequity in access to healthcare has reduced as I, as we seen in the previous slides due to national health mission. So we have to continue the national health mission simultaneously with Aishman Bharat. It has increased from 19 to 24% and access to institutional delivery and postnatal, prenatal and inpatient and outpatient has increased from previous years. India has, as, the, as, a, as we seen in the graph, India has the highest rate of out of packet expenditure in the world. The country's highest rate of gastroscopic expenditure and poverty, it may lead to poverty. So even tiny increase, even the small spending and long public expenditure will definitely lead to the decline in out of packet expenditure. The National Health Policy 2017 anticipated an increase in public spending from 1% to 2.5% of GDP, reducing 65 from 30%. It has increased from 30 to 65% of total health care spending. So it recommends that government should increase the contribution of GDP to 5% to the health sector. And finally, the insurance firms have a risk aversion. When we are going for a private insurance, definitely they have a lack of uh, formalities and procedures leads to uh, difficulty in accessing the claims so definitely insurance providers use high rates and limitations of their services covered by the insurance policy as a difference by addressing this information imbalance will be possible to provide the better products reduce rate and boost the country's insurance penetrations with that i would like to conclude thank you Thank you, Lahoradhan. It's a nice presentation. You come up with a nice view of the current scenario of the health sector and what are the scarcity, what are the outcome you suppose you expect and recommendation also. Very good presentation. But next person is anyone listening now? So shall I go next? Okay, Sanjana is going to present now. Yes, yes, sir. Okay, now we present. Sir, it's saying you cannot share screen when other participant is sharing. Yeah, okay. Sir, is it visible? Hello? Sir, is, this, is the PPT visible, sir? 
yes it is visible is is visible okay. you can start off. okay thank you uh, so my presentation is localizing climate action initiatives through decentralization and local efforts towards achieving sustainable development case studies from the state of kerala so in my introduction the sustainable development goals were adopted by the united nations uh, through the adoption of document titled transforming our world uh, and it consists of 17 sustainable development goals as everyone knows so the main point is that the goals are interconnected and require comprehensive and participatory approach in its implementation so that no one is left behind it was written in the sdg national framework report of 2020 the sdgs are not legally binding but have become de facto international ob obligations and have potential to influence millions of lives and prioritize the need for development with concern towards environment so these are the goals climate change is one of the main uh, a thing that is affecting the world right now the necessity for understanding climate change and formulating uh, measures to tackle climate change has therefore therefore becoming a, become a compelling global agenda international agencies and various nations have joined together hands together to uh, reduce the unprecedented impact of climate change through inclusion of sustainable development goals uh, and uh, it is mainly to conserve resources and promote renewable energies innovation empowering people uh, about education skills of sustainable development strengthening institutional governance and the integration of goals the recommendation of food security therefore climate action is definitely an inevitable part of sustainable development so uh, there are many uh, people who have uh, actually asked like contributed towards sustainable development in climate action and uh, that includes participation and the importance of specific groups for sustainable development and that is local governments thus contribute sus uh, sustainability to climate action nevertheless global actions replicating local local level inter in interventions can um, fall short of numbers since feasibility actually local level a uh, lot of studies are going on but the studies are actually at the local level and therefore uh, a global uh, global level outcome is not possible at this time context specific specificity including geographic social economic and political conditions and contingencies is one of the critical success factors for climate change adaptation at the local local scale but it is difficult to single out and generalize activities that is uh, um, and uh, initiatives that promise to be equally successful when transferred to other locations given the context of localizing climate action is thus imperative to understand linkages between national level state level and local level interventions for climate action and sustainable development Uh, so in climate sustainability haritha kerala mission is an umbrella mission in kerala which focuses on integrating aspects related to hygienic waste management for effective waste disposal soil and water conservation uh, and agricultural development which with special thrust on organic farming in the grassroots level haritha kerala mission hence thus the need for collaborating with various departments and stakeholders to arrive at common goal of sustainable development and it is th thus relevant to understand the role of haritha kerala mission at local level In analyzing the influence of sustainable development goals in planning and implementation at the local level, many studies have emphasized on the integrated approach. Um, and the, the localization of SDGs involves various factors, including convergence of schemes and departments. Agricultural mission is a relatively new model that has scope for research, and not many studies have been based on that because it's a re, it has been introduced in the year 2017. uh in the climate vulnerability report of districts in kerala um, the ministry of science and technology in collaboration with iit mandi iit guwahati and iisc bangalore which uh, titled uh, climate vulnerability assessment for adaptation planning in india using a common uh, framework published uh, the climate vulnerability of all districts in all, all districts in india in april 2021 in kerala 14 districts were studied and uh, based on 18 indicators there was a vulnerability index which was um, formulated and on only two districts which is malappuram and kollam which fall under a uh, relatively high category and almost all the other districts did perform really well so local level uh, local government and climate action undp considers that social and environment criteria are increasingly included in the local agendas of economic development initiatives they help reduce inequalities between territories effectively promote bottom up social cohesion create opportunities work for local business and strive to include all marginalized group particularly young women uh, young uh, young people and women in public decision making processes there is an importance of local government in implementing sdgs and to include top level decision making to grassroots level Recent studies highlight that policy response of a local government to global issues such as those shown in the SDGs is often influenced by local political orientation or to the maximum is driven by the actions of neighboring groups such as uh, state national governments which are implemented at the local level. 
there are intergovernmental relations locally raised revenues uh, actually there are issues with the uh, uh, implementation of uh, actually there are issues with the um, local government local government and climate action they are intergovernmental relations locally raised revenue political bureaucratic leadership local participation in decision making process the challenges include institutional arrangements including intergovernmental relationships both vertical and horizontal as well as partnerships for political economy of decentralization including the political will of politicians and their working relationship with bureaucrats bureaucratic environment including financial management local politics people participation accountability and international development assistance Uh, so these are all the reviews related to that so kerala has always consistently performed well in the sdg index because kerala has all uh, kerala has uh, actually localized sdgs much better than other states it has uh, scored a composite score of 65 in the sdg index in 2022 kerala institute of local administration that is kila has been interested with educating and empowering elected officials of local government decision makers and general public Kila also works to advance the SDG agenda and localize SDGs. It serves as a SDG resource center in order to mainstream SDGs in local planning, as envisaged through People Plan campaign. Kila is a partner for training, capacity building, and localization. The state Kerala State Planning Board uh, is a partner is a strategic uh, partner for planning, and also the De Department of Economics and Statistics is a partner for data and information, and Public Relations Department is a par partner for media. therefore kerala has actually devised a, a local level plan for uh, implementation of sdgs in the local areas kerala also invests a unique model of integrating various sdgs into broadly four missions the haritha kerala mission which involves waste management organic farming and water resource management the life mission which focuses on providing affordable housing to landless and homeless people in the state public education rejuvenation mission which aims at providing quality education to children and elevates schools to international standards and the ardra mission which gives emphasis for people friendly health health delivery system in the state which is uh, this all missions are called as nava kerala mission along with the sdg based budgeting in the local level uh, based on people's plan campaign uh, plan campaign aids in incorporating sdg in policy actions so the basic insights that uh, we found at the local level was that at the panchayat level generally there is basic knowledge about sdgs but there is like just the basic knowledge about sdgs but there is in depth knowledge regarding sustainable use of resources and environment conservation even before the sdgs had happened so people were already aware of how to take care of environment and how to uh, sustainably use their resources especially regarding water cons conservation and waste management at the official level there is uh, understanding about sustainable development goals and actually they really know about sustainable development goals because of the trainings given by kila and other organizations haritha kerala mission works as an umbrella scheme for implementation of sdgs uh, regarding climate action haritha uh, haritha karma sena which is the backbone of waste management at the panchayat level comprised mostly of women are involved in the dissemination of information regarding sustainable ways of waste management at the grassroots level kudumbasri mission is also involved in the training of haritha karma sena one of the issues that uh, these uh, this haritha karma sena faces is that the village people may be reluctant to pay for the waste management services and still uh, resort to disposing plastic waste waste by burning them mostly uh, haritha karma sena is involved in um, uh, processing the waste in or uh, like uh, biodegradable and non biodegradable separately but many people in the local level uh, because they are unaware they will not be interested in paying for the services and they do it by themselves so that is a main risk in their uh, uh, haritha karma sena's uh, point of view there is also a larger problem in processing waste collected by uh, the these people as it is not a profitable business model with regard to agriculture and water conservation there is much better outcome in many panchayats as panchayats take initiative and they do it by themselves and there is also a possibility of uh, sorry it's of schemes and other various missions such as sujitha mission kodumasri mission all overlapping and therefore the clarity of each of the mission will not will be lost in some way so uh, if there are so, so many missions which Hello. are working on the same yes, sir go ahead ma fine go ahead sorry sir yeah go ahead go ahead yeah yeah sure thank you sir there is also a possibility of various uh, various missions uh, for example sujitha mission is also Hello. concerned with waste management uh, also kudumbasri mission which is also concerned with waste management overlapping 
so coming to the conclusion concluding yes. part localization yeah, yeah. of climate action in kerala has been effectively put together through convergence of various schemes and programs localization has provided many avenues for integrating sustainable development goals but it is imperative to identify gaps and challenges in order to implement sdgs effectively policies related to sustainable development goals should be much more specific at the local level so as to achieve climate climate sustainability at the local level efforts are efforts are already underway in forms of training programs awareness programs by state and central government apex institutions and official uh, for officials and as well as general public these are my references thank you nice that is a field level micro level studies it is one of the good presentation my academic okay Thank uh, you. any other person does ready so person may now? i start hello sivaraj is going to present now uh, sir shall i present it sir okay okay go ahead uh, good evening everyone uh, so uh, my paper is on uh, sustainability of cities through conservation of water bodies in india an overview so it is a joint paper uh, written by uh, dr a mariyappan uh, sir from department of economics uh, loyola college chennai and uh, myself uh, basu sivraj undergrad student from department of uh, economics loyola college chennai so introduction urbanization is an inevitable process for many countries at as it is uh, an engine for growth uh, for economies uh, the world cities report 2022 states that 52% of the population currently resides in urban areas and expected to grow to 57% in uh, 2030 and 66% in uh, 2050 so more than half of the population is going to live in urban areas so urbanization uh, has a there there has been a rise in demand for resources and a expansion of urban areas thus uh, land becomes a uh, scarce in urban cities like uh, chennai and all so the objectives of the studies are this this study focus on the issues that arises due to urbanization with particular reference to water bodies to study the depletion of water bodies due to urbanization in india to review the current status of indian cities with specific reference to chennai to suggest viable option for better planning of urban areas so if you can see uh, that uh, sustainable development is a crucial indicator of well being of nations uh, the sustainable development goal sdg 11 focuses on uh, sustainability of the cities so the focus is on uh, access to housing and basic services sustainable uh, uh transport system uh, and etc so what and challenge water challenges uh, of uh, urban india so niti ayog reported that india is suffering from the worst uh, water crisis in its history and almost uh, 600 million of its population uh, is water deprived so a lot of uh, places like uh, people uh, don't get uh, enough water uh, and are water deprived and unicef uh, estimates that waterborne diseases uh, have an economic burden of uh, approximately uh, uh, 600 uh, million us dollar uh, in a year in india so so in addition to the point that uh, waterborne diseases uh, lack of uh, what to say the flooding uh, causes more economic problem because uh, if there is flood in the city uh, usually people can't uh, travel for 2 3 days and uh, which uh, put down the economic activity happening in the city so chennai is uh, a city surrounded by lake and it can uh, rightly be called uh, as the land of uh, lakes a study uh, conducted by the department of geology uh, by anna university revealed that a number of water bodies uh, in the year 9, 18 93 was 60 uh, and uh, downhill to 28 in uh, 20 uh, 17 and there has been a massive depletion of ground water uh, resources and uh, to add on to the point uh, that uh, water bodies in in and around the city are uh, contracted from uh, 12.6 square kilometer in uh, 1893 to 3.2 uh, square kilometer in uh, 2017 it's nearly a uh, one third uh, of the water bodies are left in uh, the city if you see the map uh, it is a map taken from uh, 
1983 you could see the whole uh, lake has been disappeared it's uh, the nungambakam area you could see that uh, nungambakam area is uh, prone to flooding because uh, there is no water bodies uh, to take in the water the only thing uh, which is left is uh, the kuvam river if i'm right so uh, in conclusion uh, water is a uh, elixir of life and uh, there is a need uh, for a sensational among the residents uh, of chennai to reclaim the water bodies so people uh, should uh, protect the water bodies because uh, it is the only uh, thing which can uh, avoid uh, make us to avoid the floods and uh, a holistic uh, development model uh, that takes place into consideration of uh, sustainability is crucial and restoration of water bodies revamping the storm water drains distilling the waterways uh, would reduce the flooding of the city and modernizing uh, sewage water treatment and uh, solid waste disposal uh, are all uh, measures that can be undertaken to protect the remaining water bodies in uh, chennai city thank you thank you bas suraj nice presentation that uh, any more presenters is there asal you have a discussion sir one sir okay ravi is there uh, ravi through our from through through our okay so you can present now uh, sir my i am my address dr p ragu department of economics trivia government arts college through our and my topics on economic analysis of governance of health insurance among people of through our municipality what is health insurance health insurance on instrument wherein an individual or group purchase of health care coverage in advance by paying a free call premium statement of the problem with the increasing health awareness life expectancy and lifestyle disease health insurance has become a need of the hour to meet high medical expenses the public is now expected to health insurance health insurance one of the enabling factor of health service utilization need of for the study the study was conducted by questionnaire customer who have already bought to the product prospective customer who are willing to buy the product and the prospective customer who are using similar kind of products the study is conducted with the objectives of giving insight into the customer's needs and preference regarding health insurance product the study is limited to the throughout town only and the level of awareness and respective analysis with reference to the above place significance of the study the study is no about the policy holder awareness about medical claim insurance provided by star health and check the perception based on awareness and satisfaction scope of the study the awareness and the respective of a product the critical stage of any product life cycle because it is in cell production and the promotional level of the product the study helps to ascertain respective of new health products the study in cell evaluation of product would help the company identify set of the people who would buy the product with a special attention to the demographic profile such as age income gender and occupation objectives of the study first object they to find out the awareness of health insurance among people of through our town second object to find out the ratio among awareness and the purchase of health insurance by people third objective to find out preferable health insurance company by people of study area fourth objective to find out the knowledge about health insurance company terms and condition among people fourth to determine the association of between awareness of health insurance with the selected demographic variables or last objectives to give suggestion to improve awareness of health insurance methodology of the study the study is based on the both primary and secondary data the first primary data 50 samples is question policy holder the secondary data collected from the company file reports journals and website sampling area the study was conducted in throughout town area for only limited pre population chosen at random basic uh, statistical tools percentage and weighted average prayed 2022 two months april 2022 may 2022 the limitation of the study the limitation of this current study was small non probability sample convention second limitation the size of the sample compared to population was very small therefore some of the findings some slightly lost findings it is found that 70% of the population were aware about health insurance and only 30% were unaware about pam second objective findings it is found that 36% of respondents said that family or friends or relative or colleges primary source of information followed by age and 25% the television 26% all the families who had taken health insurance 40% of them 
thought that insurance for health refund of cost. Last conclusion of the study, it is concluded that from studies respondent are ever ever health insurance, take health insurance to medical claim policy. People got trust more on public general insurance company rather than private general insurance company to avail the health insurance policy. Respondents were not much aware regarding the health insurance policy. Terms and conditions according to the health insurance company are not transparent. Thus, health insurance still has wide scope in India, but it is supposed to be easy to understand and accessible. Thanks, and the army, sir. Thanks, and thank you. Okay, any more questions? Sir, yes, sir. Okay, Sahar. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, you can present. Sahar is going to present now. Yes, sir. Sir, is it visible, sir? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you, sir. I am Sahar Kori, a research scholar from the Department of Anthropology, Pondicherry University. Uh, my title is uh, Impact of COVID-19 on the Health of the Chengdu of Nolamala Hills of Andhra Pradesh. Uh, actually, uh, this COVID-19, which was caused in China, it became a significant public threat to human beings. Uh, and also, World Health Organization also uh, declared COVID-19 as a public uh, global pandemic. Uh, in India, uh, most of the people live in rural areas, around 60 to 65%, and even having very uh, low healthcare facilities in India. Uh, to contain the spread of the disease, the uh, government of India imposed the lockdown. Uh, due to this lockdown, there was a restriction um, of mo movement of people. Uh, and there was a effect on people and there was a travel ban, everything like that. Uh, in, during lockdown, uh, most of the health resources like medical staff, technical staff were shifted to COVID-19 management. Uh, this delayed the treatment of non-COVID-19 patients like asthma, heart patients, like everything else like that. Uh, my objectives are like uh, health facilities utilized by the changes before and during the lockdown. Like, is there any changes or challenges they faced placing like institutional deliveries, child immunization, normal health checkups? And the second objective is challenges they faced during the lockdown in their livelihood activities, health and food system. Uh, I done my field work in the Atmoko division of Karnal district. These are the six villages. One is Bayerluti Gudam, Naguliti Gudam, Palam Chiru, Chedran Panta, Aramatam, and Jaran Gudam. These are all the uh, changes are the particularly vulnerable tribal groups. Uh, this is the population of the villages, uh, six villages. Uh, this is the methodology and data collection. Uh, from February to May, I collected the data related to livelihoods and from uh, July, July to October, I collected data regarding the impact of COVID-19 health status of the changes. Uh, consent was taken from individuals. Uh, secondary data I have taken from hospitals. Uh, I got permission from the hospitals also. Uh, data was analyzed through excellent percentage calculator. Uh, results like uh, changes who are uh, particularly well, vulnerable tribal groups, they are less affected with COVID-19. Uh, in this in this area, only 38 positives are there, and only zero deaths we can see. Um, most of the people are not affected, and even they are having positive. Uh, they are showing uh, symptomatic to the uh, a disease, unlike the rest of the people. Uh, reasons are like they live in isolated places, and even some of the outside outsiders who are willing to come inside their communities, the people who are staying in that uh, villages, they are not allowing them inside. It has a preventive measure to contain the spread. Uh, this is the COVID-19 positives uh, village-wise. Uh, we can see there are no deaths in the entire six villages. Uh, coming to the first objective, institutional deliveries among the changes. Uh, I have collected data uh, from PHCs, uh, institutional deliveries in the 2019 and the year 2020, because uh, uh, 2020 was the year uh, in which uh, there were severe uh, uh, threat of threat of COVID-19 to the people. Uh, in the 2020, we can see that there was increase in the institutional deliveries compared to the year 2019. I went child immunization also. There was increase in um, 2020 uh, compared to the 2019. Uh, 
coming to the healthcare facilities used by the changes, uh, they have faced uh, many problems uh, like before COVID-19, uh, basically RLPs who are nearby towns, they, they go to the changes villages and they treat sick people who are sick. And um, most of the people who go to the RMP hospitals for health checkups. Uh, during the lockdown, most of the people were afraid of uh, getting COVID positives and other risk factors. Because of this, uh, it resulted in declining in health, uh, visiting healthcare facilities. Uh, most of the people, they never visited uh, RMP hospitals because of uh, getting COVID positives. Uh, they visited nearby THCs uh, near, to the, near to their villages. Uh, even during the uh, lockdown, primary health centers conducted awareness programs, government sponsored coaches, uh, carried uh, vaccination drive in the Chinchu villages. This PSC also provided masks, sanitizers, soaps, and awareness programs. Uh, uh, we can see uh, this uh, bar diagram that 2019, uh, most of the people uh, going to the health PHCs were decreased in 2020 because of if they go to the hospitals, uh, they may get uh, positive from others or else even having cold fever, it may be tested as uh, tested positive for COVID. Because of this fear, they were uh, there was a decrease in visiting to health facilities. And they, uh, the challenges faced in livelihood and uh, uh, change of health because uh, of COVID, because of lockdown, this that their major a source of livelihood is uh, energy. Uh, energy has to be done as a group. If one person in the group is affected, uh, tested positive, other persons uh, in the group will be uh, may affect with COVID-19. Because of this reason, the government suspended this energy program, and also this uh, uh, the other source of income of them is uh, minor forest produce. Uh, if they sell this uh, forest produce to the other persons because of fear they may get uh, COVID-19 with other pers other persons because of this fear also uh, their, their income was reduced. Uh, some of the women changes goes to the uh, wage labor in the fields of other people. Uh, during COVID-19 uh, most of the agriculture, uh, agriculture activities were suspended and also they lost their wage labor income also. Because of this uh, loss of their livelihood, uh, they face many severe uh, financial problems. Even they are not able to uh, buy their basic needs and they could not afford to visit any private hospitals for health checkups. Uh, in the lockdown, they mainly uh, depended on the pensions and financial support provided by the government of Andhra Pradesh. Uh, like uh, as they lost their uh, income sources, um, they faced uh, uh, buying the food, food materials, groceries like that. Uh, the most of the vo volunteer organizations like uh, if you call Foundation Rural Development Trust, those who are working in these uh, Chinchu areas, they come and they they given uh, rice bags, groceries, masks, sanitizers, and also I tell the importance of physical distance, everything like that. And also they got regular ration and essential food items from the state government. In some cases, like if the family is extended family, uh, the food and groceries will finish soon. Like then they will be surviving by eating the rice with pickles, uh, chili powder like that. They have faced this problem in food habits. Uh, according to uh, other than food, they have also experienced some lifestyle changes uh, with these challenges that they appeared in their life, they were able to overcome out, out of it as a resilient. Uh, this is conclusion. Um, uh, Chinchus uh, have taken many precautions to, to contain the spread of COVID-19, even though uh, there were few positive cases and no deaths, but they have faced uncertain future due to the disruptions caused in their economic life, uh, like uh, suspension of energy scheme, decline in sale of MFPs and loss of wage labor. However, due to their location and timely integration by the government and non-governmental organizations, the infection was very low and death rate, uh, death, this also very less, no, no deaths. Uh, 
today they are slowly getting back on their feet and it will uh, concluded efforts from all the friends like people the various ngos working in this area and the state governments to ensure the sustainability of their way of life thank you thank you for your presentation uh, any other presentation is there yes sir hello okay gaudam okay okay gaudam you can present now yeah 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 is it visible now yeah is my screen is visible sir yes yes yeah yes yes good afternoon sir very you know very pleased to meet you all of you and my name is gautam akon i am a phd research scholar for uh, for the you know the specialized area from the genetic sociology from the mysore university and i am a uh, citizen from south america so this is my you know the title of the paper the growing need of a zero psychological intervention in older adults so let's begin with here that uh, yeah so in any production that uh, what is a, you know the zero psychology and older adults the zero psychological is a branch of psychology that focuses on understanding and assisting older people and their families in maintaining their well being overcoming challenges and uh, reaching their full pot uh, potential in later life the study of the physical elements of aging as well as the mental social and so, uh, societal uh, ramification of aging is known as gerontology uh, various curable mental health uh, illnesses affect older person just the two uh, younger adults so here we see with that uh, uh, elderly people are uh, entering nursing homes later and sicker than uh, ever before uh, resulting in patients who are more physically frail and complicated requiring more advanced care and therapy so mostly you know let's i will tell uh, <clears throat> trying to explain you orally so uh, it is a branch with you know the psychological that a person who uh, get they in the uh, older age at the stage they need uh, you know the psychosocial support as well as for they need a uh, support for uh, facing uh, issues challenges uh, as in all aspect here which you know the uh, background uh, many areas of psychology place a lot of uh, emphasis on the cognitive behavioral and de uh, development changes that occur during the lifespan of individual however clinical psychologists frequently lack expertise on their particular difficulties of uh, older adulthood which highlights the significance of zero uh, psychology let's i'll move it because there i think there are remain many scholars who are supposed to present after me and this is the aim of the uh, aims and objective the goal of this article is to look at the effect of behavioral and related psychological intervention in the aging process of older person uh, your concerns needs and goal as well as the findings from your uh, neuropsychological evaluation will be taken into account when uh, tailoring in a neuropsychological intervention intervention seeks to enhance your quality of life and lessen effect of cognitive impairment on daily functioning and the role of here we see with the role of the zero psychologist uh, an expert in the treating of elderly is a geriatric psychology uh, this therapy may uh, address mental health issues or providing support for recognizing and managing aging a phd degree in psychology with a focus on a uh, adult development and aging required to work as a geriatric psychology uh, we are trying to explain that you know the what qualification will be required to work as a zero psychologist in terms of working with the elderly person so uh, issues you know the principal issues we see in a elderly geriatric population first with these of like biopsychosocial issues that older people and their families face such as behavior health issues such as sleeplessness and discomfort second with uh, behavior health concerns such as depression and anxiety dementia and behavior lifestyle related changes changes in decision making or uh, every day living abilities coping with and managing chronic disease loss and grief adjustment to uh, aging related pressure and such as a marital uh, family conflict and shifting responsibilities and of life care so this is the capital we see with the hope efficacy resilience uh, optimism psychological capital the clinical educational and neuro psychological we see that here uh, okay uh, older adults with uh, connectedness participation and independence one of the most essential human need is what 
is known as social need, which is the need for love, acceptance and belonging. One of the most significant factor of good aging has been shown to be having an active social life and meaningful relationship. Loneliness and social isolation can arise when uh, social needs are not met. So uh, <clears throat> second with the evidence regarding the social requirement of the older adults was addressed in the systematic review as well as the trial traits of successful intervention for meeting those needs. There is a great deal evidence to support the importance of addressing social needs among older adults, mostly their desire for connectedness, participation, and independence. And uh, we make a suggestion here with especially we see in terms of recommendation, older people want to participate actively and meaningfully in all aspects of lives, uh, including social network, neighborhood and community service provider and the government must take into account of the fact that a loss of uh, meaning or purpose can worsen as the, uh, as the people age. So sorry for interruption, I will not take more time. And this is, come on, I'm, I, I would like to come on conclusion. The need of designing care models and supporting services based on the requirement of the older person was stressed. Psychological treatment are beneficial. It covers a wide range of psychological treatment for older persons suffering from depression, anxiety, dementia, cognitively impaired illness, and personality disorder. In, uh, in addition, a variety of tools are available to assist older persons and their families in determining the changes that must be made in order to cope with losses and maintain purposes and hope. Geropsychological focus on understanding and assisting older people and their families in maintaining their well-being, overcoming challenges and reaching their full potential in their later life. Okay, so here are the references. And so thank you very much. Muchas, muchas gracias. Con su tiempo. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Gauda. Uh, any more presentation? Yes, any sir. Jackie, uh, that? Yes, sir. Uh, we can present now. Uh, yeah, so my topic uh, is for analysis, uh, sorry, an economic analysis in treating lifestyle disorder, uh, seeing under both allopathy and alternative medicine. Uh, so uh, as we know, the launch of uh, WHO Global Center for the Traditional Medicines in India has marked the beginning for new efforts in South Asia, in Southeast Asian to leverage the potential of traditional health and well-being. Uh, it is seen that globally 80% of the people uh, access traditional medicine and uh, I think traditional medicine must continue to be a critical tool in promoting a healthier uh, and more sustainable future uh, for all the for all in keeping the culture practice and knowledges. Uh, so as we know uh, the COVID entirely shook the uh, health industry uh, looking onto it I have uh, taken this topic to look onto the uh, cost and effectiveness in both the alternative and uh, allopathy medicine. Um, uh, yes, the, though basically in this study, uh, we are identifying if there if there are any socioeconomic factors that influence uh, the choice of medicine, uh, uh, choice of medicine that is both alternative and allopathy medicine. Uh, and we also looked on to the cost and effectiveness in treating uh, lifestyle disorders. Uh, the source of collecting data was uh, two, uh, were in two types, that is primary and secondary. Primary data we collected through the questionnaire and secondary collected through the websites. Uh, and the methodology we have followed is a chi-square. Uh, we also run a cost-effective ratio, ANOVA, trend line, and few two-step cluster and bar charts. Uh, this is the first objective. Uh, so the first objective is looking on to, to evaluate the socioeconomic factors uh, that may influence the choice of traditional uh, choice of taking up the uh, allopathy or alternative medicine. Uh, so we run the chi-square here and the 
a significant result shows that except uh, age, there is no significant in choosing the uh, choosing any form of the medicine. Uh, so basically, with age also, there are uh, the results also show that. Uh, uh, people with the age of 30 to 45 mostly prefer uh, taking up uh, alternative medicine and uh, people with uh, people with the age of uh, uh, 18 and above uh, 60 uh, did not prefer to take alternative medicine as it was uh, as a results uh, shown in treating the health was slower than the uh, conventional medicine uh, we have run the um, Two cluster, uh, two step cluster verification. Uh, sorry, uh, graph. This shows that um, so zero is basically the uh, denoting the alternative medicine, and one is the conventional medicine that is allopathy. Uh, so it is shown that uh, uh, gender uh, with male is dominated using alternative medicine uh, while as uh, allopathy is uh, more uh, dominated by taking with female uh, as i told uh, alternative medicine is preferred uh, morely by uh, age brackets of 30 to 45 uh, while uh, 15 to 30 years of age bracket is preferred to be used with the conventional medicine and uh, we also uh, looked on to the cured uh, i mean the percentage of uh, curing the ailment that is lifestyle disorders uh, so it is shown that 83 percent uh, was more uh, 83 percent of the people told that uh, their ailment was cured under alternative medicine than in uh, uh, conventional medicine that is 70 uh, percent and the second objective uh, was to look on look on to the co uh, cost and effectiveness uh, so the cost includes both the uh, medication cost and the uh, consultation cost. Uh, so we saw by, by running the cost effectiveness uh, ratio, we saw that alternative uh, medicine was better off than the allopathy medicine. People told that uh, the cost in alternate in treating uh, lifestyle disorders under alternative medicine uh, was uh, considered to be better off. I mean, uh, the cost uh, for uh, medicine and uh, the consultation was better off with alternative medicine than in compared to allopathy. Uh, so as you can also see that uh, the cured under alternative medicine is told to be higher than in allopathy. Uh, so to justify this a uh, cost effectiveness ratio we also run a statistical analysis which is ANOVA uh, but the ANOVA results show she did not uh, show the significance much uh, though the alternative medicine was better off but the significant is not much uh, looking onto the third objective uh, third objective was basically to look onto the funds uh, that was released by governments towards the uh, upliftment of both alternative and allopathy medicine. Uh, so the first graph is showing the uh, yearly budget allocation. Uh, as you all know that, uh, uh, as you all know that funds were released uh, onto the Ayush uh, after the eighth five year plan. Uh, so we can see that uh, of course allopathy is better off. I mean allopathy uh, has been uh, given more preference and uh, funded more than the Ayush. But later, uh, of course, later uh, with uh, uh, with time, uh, there has been increase in uh, funds with alternative medicine also. Uh, so concluding, as I told uh, that uh, the socioeconomic factors did not much affect the choice of uh, uh, taking up the medicines uh, except the age and uh, there was no much variant variation like in variation um, in the cost and effectiveness of treating lifestyle disorders under both alternative and uh, alternative and allopathy medicine uh, and uh, there is also an extra result showing that uh, among the ayush uh, people preferred more uh, ayurveda to be treated under and uh, lifestyle disorders such as diabetes, hypertension, uh, PCOD, stress and depression was uh, more preferred to be treated under alternative medicine uh, medicines and uh, uh, due, mainly due to uh, no side effects, natural 
organic and efficiency and uh, while on to the allopathy uh, people uh, mostly preferred allopathy of course because of the availability uh, fast results and convenience and it also showed that uh, disease uh, lifestyle diseases such as insomnia heart disease obesity uh, allergy and constipations were preferred to be uh, uh, treated under allopathy medicine than on to the alternative medicine yeah thank you sir Hello, it's a nice presentation. You have made a very good attempt for each and every objective. It's clearly used the tools and the research. Uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, any more paper presenters there? Yeah. Okay. Who is going to present now? Sir, uh, my presentation is not ready, sir. Sir, shall I? Sir, excuse me, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Hussein, Jacob? Yes, sir. Okay, you can press now. Okay. Time, uh, keep on your time, only four minutes. Okay, sir. Okay, good evening to one and all present here. On behalf of all the go uh, others and show or reporters on the session, the coordinator on this conference to give me the opportunity to present my views. And my topic is India's performance to reducing the impact of malnutrition. So, man made conflict introduction. The man made conflict, climate change, economic stagnation serve as the causes of the malnutrition suffering, suffering for 135 million people at the world, world, according to the UN SDG report of 2019. UN IGME, an average of 48 million of children under the age of five may die before 2013, while an equal share will be in a newborn. So it's a pathetic situation. India is ranked as a 101 out of 116 countries in the global hunger in hunger in this report of 2021. The poor child health care records and socioeconomic gains pushed the countries into the vicious circle of poverty. The National Family Health Survey of 2015-16 says that the standing among the students under the five was in Kerala is in a high, uh, high Kerala is in the lowest and the UP, UP is in the highest. So most of the studies are uh, <clears throat> most of the study uh, most of the studies are focusing on the India stand to the terms of malnutrition and the district wise mal malnutrition and child child healthcare. So here we are in, uh, aiming the aim to address the prevalence of malnutrition among the under five children in India and government's budget allocation reducing the nutritional deficiency among the children and the addressing the nutritional uh, needs that means the zero hunger. The, the materials are collected, the data are collected from the different sources. The first one is the Global Hunger Index Report of 2021 and Food and Agriculture Organization of Data Set, Union Budget Ministry of uh, Finance 2019 to 20, 2020 to 21, and demand for the grants of grants in 2020 and 21. The Press Information Bureau of PIB. The period of study is in 2002 and 4 to 6 and 10 to 12 and 19 to 21. Because the more data of malnutrition rate and child wasting, child study, and the under 5 mortality rate are available only for this period. In this, in this table is an explaining the nutritional deficiency of a child on the under 5 age group of an India. So in this field, Hango, in 2002 to 2002, India is maintained the very alarming score is 38.8 percentage. Meanwhile, through the massive implementation of nutrition programs, and India has been weathered the situation reducing the malnutrition from 37.4 per percentage in 2004 to 6 to 28.8 percentage in 2010 to 12. On the contradictory, it is clear from the table one that is an India is a marketing budget allocation for the decades of 2010 to 20 has been reduced the malnutrition by the just 4.62 percentage between 10 to 12 and 19 to 21. However, India is still serious making in 107 out of countries out of 116 countries. Beside the level of undernutrition uh, increased from 18.4 percentage of 2002 to 2000, 2002 and 19.2. 19.6 percentage 2004 to 6, while allocation has been changed 15 percentage and 15.3 percentage subsequent year. Although there is a slight changes from the 10 to 12 and 19 to 21, it is still positive. That is 1.98 percentage. In comparison of standing, is the more serious problem among the children under five than bursting from the bursting from the peak 
of 54.2 percentage is in 2002-2002, declining to the 37.4 percentage in 1921, indicating that India is still struggling. The compact of turning among the children is under the five. Also, under the five, mortality rate shows the positive change of an 41.86 percentage between 5.2 percentage in 2010 to 12 and 3.4 percentage in 1992-1921. So Shaha is saying, say that, stated that India's child malnutrition crisis is largely due to the historical incident of poverty, inequalities, and food insecurities. The second table is an explain the malnutrition deficit, uh, defect of India in population in Indian, uh, population in millions. The table explain uh, <clears throat> the table to ex express the proportion of the malnutrition among the children under the five in the millions of according to the food and food and agriculture organization data numbers and origin and stern the overnighting of the people in India in during 2002-2002 was found to be 998.3 percent and 63.7 and 4.2 millions in subsequent year of malnutrition among the under five children is increasing 24.9 six percentage in the 2004 to six the stunning and overweighting decreased from by 2.2 percentage and 8.3 percentage correspondingly to in the year of 10 to 12 19 193.1 and 53.6 and 3.1 million children were affected by the malnutrition stunning and overweight between 2010 to 12 and 19 to 21 malnutrition among under five children in india was increased by the 15 percentage followed by the standing of the overweight by 39.0 percentage and 34 percentage uh, respectively. The fourth round of National Family Health Survey of conducted 2015 to 16 found that malnutrition rate are high, especially in the rural areas. So the, <clears throat> uh, in the, this table is explained the India has implemented various major programs in estimating the prevalence of malnutrition. But as the implemented schemes that are back to 1917 present, table nine, table three, the 1975, India has introduced ICDS to improve the nutritional status of children and educate the feeding women about the nutritional needs of children. In the financial year of the physical year 2019 to 20, government of India allocated 17,705 crores, which was reduced by 2.6 percentage and to 17,252 crores in the physical years of 2020-21. In the year of 2007, NFMSM was implemented, implemented to the addressing the food and nutrition security and ensure the accessibility, adequacy, affordability of the food and food prices. In the physical year 19 to 20, India has been come up with the budget price of 1,500 costs and has been witnessed by the growth of 32.45 percentage within the rupees of 2,000 crore rupees. In the physical year of uh, 2020 and 21, in the contradicting the flagship of programs of Porsche Habia, Abhyan, the National Nutrition Mission, which was launched in 2018, focused the children, allowed adults and girls and pregnant women and located the women will be has a decreasing 66.6 percentage physical year. In 2019 to 20, 83 percentage, 0.8 percentage revised the budget is compared to the budget estimate. Lastly, MBM program, later renamed as an APM portion, is the major source of the food for school of going children. From the physical year 2019 to 20, 2000, physical 2021 to 22, the budget increased by 32.8 percentage from the 9,609 crore rupees to 12,817 crores. Later, the budget administered by the MDM program for the financial year 2021 has been reduced 11.5 and to 10.23 to 3,000 crores, respectively. Theoretical perception. In this general theory of focusing on the uh, focusing on the themes of and all those on the innovative ideas and need by the global trends. The poverty is the root cause of the food insecurity of the nutritional deficiency, which was a name it says by the Molo and Korea in the 2005. Then second one, to there is a two-way link between the malnutrition and poverty. And out of the concept of the vicious circle of poverty and his telling poverty is the root cause of any food insecurity and nutrition deficiency. So 
therefore the study is considering the cap uh, therefore the study is an uh, considering the capital formation of government appropriation so according to the researcher the circle of nutrition defined as an a creation of the healthy generation will slowing the seeds of any future growth if the government is to investment priorities nutrition physical well being and human resource development and other ways to around the patriotic circle is nutrition so last four minutes okay the basic uh, uh, basic assumption the nutrition across out to determined by the government allocation for the nutrition related schemes and the future domestic production today is so depending upon the nutrition fill up the bellies of the nation the children and third one is the past 10 years the nation sectoral financial allocation neglected by the people's health concern so there's a theoretical explanation so the vicious circle of poverty is linked with the malnutrition side the little budget allocation create the under utilization of resources and it created the inequality of the food and insecurity which lead to the malnutrition of standing waste and which creating the uh, creating unhealthy workforces and which uh, which results which resulted low productivity of the citizen and finally it reached the low little budget or the low budget allocation so we can do we, we need to break the vicious circle of the malnutrition only in two ways a disparate fund into the product channel and the short term and long term investment policies conclusions and recommendation covid-19 pandemic has been a disaster to achieving the sbs goal zero hunger ending hunger and ensuring access to the nutrition and sufficient food also allocation of the welfare program have been declined in the past two decades reducing the in, um, reducing in, uh, reducing the increasing malnutrition among the children thereby undermining the sdgs achievement sdgs has to close uh, to is closely related with the one that is poverty eradication essentially this uh, essentially this not only focusing on providing nut uh, nutrition but also it's for focusing on the poverty alleviation so we need to collaborate with this uh, this ministers rural development public distribution of the civil supply health and family welfare women and de child development and drinking water sanction agriculture tribe affairs and more to uh, more minority affairs so there is a and another point is there is need to reduce the gap on this data and invest more social welfare program and monitor the budget on the allocations and the specific program track the, and finally the recommendation is track to flow the fund into the rural area because most of the malnutrition problems are affecting in the rural area so we need to track the flow of the fund into the rural areas thank you very good nice attempt and uh... Give a valid recommendation. Uh, I request the chair, uh, yes. Mr. Anand, sir, sir, yes. uh, please wind up this session, sir, because like we are going beyond our schedule. Okay. We have two more technical sessions to come the tomorrow, so that whoever have left over can present the paper in the uh, next two technical sessions. Okay. Uh, please wind up the session with the report. Okay. Okay. Uh, any more the questions for the paper presenters? Or just for two minutes? Four minutes, Madam. So late, Madam. Can I report it? Sir, there is no question. You can uh, report this. Uh, submit the report of this technical session, uh, Madam. So, uh, sir, good evening. I am Dr. Mariyappan from Lila College. Yeah, yeah. That's the question. <laughs> sir, uh, my observation. I don't wanted to ask any more question because of time. It's running short of time also. uh even I, i would like to congratulate the organizer the way in which wonderful way dr arun sir is conducting this icss sponsored national uh, conference and thank even, you thank you bro and dr anadray sir is also very nicely giving space for the uh, okay. presenters just in a motivated way and a highly commendable way even you are appreciating the paper presenters also sir okay. youngsters you. are now coming and research scholars are now presenting even the very nice way their presentation also on a different different angle from the afternoon when gopinath sir started to uh, deliver his lecture from there to till now i'm uh, listening every one of them every one is in a different different perspective and they did their own analysis in different level and they have done a great job congratulations to all the presenters too thank you so much thank you thank you uh, thank you professor for joining us okay pleasure to have you. okay Madam, we can sum up the technical session of this. Sure, sir. Good evening, sir. A respected organizer, a respected uh, session chair, and uh, delegates. Um, it's it's a proud privilege of mine to be delivering the rapporteur's report now. So I will try to make it brief and uh, still do justice to what I can. So we had about um, eight. No, we had about ten presentations uh, this evening in the technical session one. The first speaker, Miss um, Meha Mahajan. 
spoke about a, a viable alternative to plastics. The researcher insisted the need for a sustainable environment alternative today and, uh, and primarily said that the problems arising was mainly due to single-use plastic and said bioplastic is a viable alternative that can be used. Also, the, the researcher also put the onus, the responsibility back on uh, people to make the earth a better place. So the second speaker, uh, the spe uh, second presenter, Ms. Uma, Assistant Professor from the Ambedkar Government Arts College, Puducherry, uh, spoke about uh, the healthcare for the elderly in India and the issues and challenges associated with it. Uh, she spoke about uh, the vulnerable groups and focused on seniors who actually need uh, uh, their interest to be taken care of. The researcher spoke about few important policies and insisted that while there are a lot of welfare policies that are there, they are still very inadequate. And it is the time of the uh, hour. The need of the hour is that uh, the state focuses on many uh, elderly friendly schemes. Uh, so finally, the researcher concluded that the state has a lot to do in this regard. So the third presenter was Mr. Loganathan, PhD scholar from the Central University of Tiruvadu. His paper was the current scenario of the healthcare in India. Uh, it was an overview of the healthcare system. And uh, he spoke about the adjustments and reforms in the healthcare sector, such as telemedicine and uh, things like that. The researcher drew attention to the, um, the fact that the global life expectancy had, had reduced during COVID and there has been a decline in neonatal diseases. And uh, the researcher also insisted on challenges faced by the health sector, the shortage of medical professionals, lack of focus on individual research, inefficient financial allocation, lack of preventive uh, cases. And finally, uh, the researcher finished with certain important recommendations such as improving access and quality of medical facilities in India and to improve insurance penetration in India by bringing out the rates of insurance. The fourth presenter, Ms. Sanjana, uh, from the Department of Local Governance, Rajiv Gandhi National Institute of Youth Development, localizing climate action initiatives through decentralization and local efforts focused on case studies from Kerala. Kerala has uh, consequently retained its position as a top performer in the annual SGD. Uh, SDG performance index since 2018. Um, the researcher focused our attention to certain important schemes such as Harita Kerala mission, life mission, public education rejuvenation mission, and Ardham mission, which em emphasizes on people-friendly health uh, delivery system in the state. The fifth presenter, Dr. Ma Mariappan and uh, Basu Sivaraj of Loyola College focus on sustainability of cities through conservation of water bodies in India. Specifically, they focus on the issues that arise due to urbanization with specific reference to water bodies, the shrinkage of water bodies and lack of proper water management was their mainstay, uh, was the mainstay of their study. They analyzed the depletion of water bodies and uh, with specific uh, focus on the Nungambakam area, which has disappeared over the past 40 years. So holistic development model, which calls for sustainability is the need of the R, is their conclusion. Uh, the sixth presenter, uh, Dr. Pri Raghu, Assistant Professor of uh, Tiruvika Arts College, Tiruvaru, talks about the economic analysis of health insurance among people of the Tiruvarur municipality. So the researcher primarily focuses on the ratio of purchase of health insurance, knowledge of insurance instruments among people, and uh, the statistical analysis proved that only 30% of the people were unaware and about 70% of the people had awareness about the various insurance schemes that were available. And a 36 percentage, for 36 percentage of the people, the primary source of information were from their family and friends. So people uh, trust the public health insurance uh, segments much more than the private companies. So that was uh, an interesting area of uh, his study. So Sagar Kodi of Pondicherry University uh, focused on the impact of COVID-19 on the health of the Chenjus of the Nallamalla Hills of Andhra Pradesh. A total of six villages were taken where uh, the data analysis was done, data collection and analysis was done. So Chenchus being a vulnerable group still had some interesting insights here that only 38 positives were on the whole uh, deciphered and only and fortunately there were only zero deaths. But however, uh, their livelihoods took a beating and regular because the regular source of income was reduced. So definitely they faced a lot of uncertainties due to this period and they're slowly bouncing back to normalcy after the COVID. So that was uh, on the Chinchu tribes of Andhra Pradesh. The eighth speaker was Gautam Makwana, whose focus was on the growing need of zero psychological intervention in older adults. Uh, the researcher from Mizoram University as well had a very interesting perspective of uh, psychology, zero psychology, a branch of psychology that basically focuses on understanding and assisting older people and their families in maintaining their well-being. It is a very, very niche area in psychology. 
Uh, the researcher focuses on uh, issues in geriatric population and their issues such as unmet needs for love, acceptance, and meaningful relationships. And uh, the government has to design certain care models that keep into account uh, their the needs of the elderly as well. So that was a, a very beautiful novel study by the researcher. So Zakia Taj and Dr. Lakshmi from the Mount Carmel College, uh, Bangalore, focus on the economic analysis in treating lifestyle disorders under allopathy and alternative medicine. So they compare the effectiveness, cost and effectiveness of both forms of medicine, alternative medicine and allopathy, and whether any socioeconomic factors did have any influencing in the choice of medicine. And age is an important variable that influences the choice of medicine. As far as gender is concerned, the male gender gravitates more towards uh, alternative medicine and women stick to allopathy. Uh, the compensation cost effectiveness between the two types of medicine showed that alternative medicines fared better than allopathy. So uh, there is an upward sloping trend line in both the uh, ministries as far as allocation was concerned for both forms of medicine. The 10th speaker, Shah Hussein and uh, her colleagues study India's action plan on reducing malnutrition among children. So they start, uh, they start their uh, presentation uh, talking about the various man-made conflicts and economic stagnation. It has a direct impact on children and their nutritional requirements. They discuss various statistics about the undernourished uh, and uh, child mortality, wastage, stunting, and uh, a very informative session on um, the midday meal scheme, the portion beyond the zero hunger program, and the ICDS besides others. So um, also they bring about the theoretical perspectives regarding food security, nutritional deficiency, hunger, and the vicious cycle of poverty and malnutrition. So COVID-19 typically has been a disaster for the SGD2, which is zero hunger. And they say that removal of poverty and malnutrition in children actually go hand in hand. Both of, us then, both of them have to be addressed in tandem. So with that, uh, I would like to conclude my report. I thank the organizer once again for this opportunity. Now I hand the session back to the chairperson. Thank you. Good evening to all the paper presenter. Thank you to each and every presenter. The second their time. Otherwise, it's not possible to complete in time. Uh, once again, thank you for all the paper presenter. And, uh, session and uh, a hearty congratulations for my friend uh, Dr. Arun given this opportunity for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, to all the participants, like that's all from here for today. Like you can join us tomorrow by 10 a.m. sharp. Till then take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.